I, 29M, gave up everything to raise my sister because my parents were addicts. She bailed on me once she got on her feet, and I was homeless. My sister from a young age has had only one person to rely on and that person was me. We come from a broken family with one parent that was only around till I was five and the other who was stuck in a cycle of addiction. Because of our situation I grew up very quickly and shielded her from as much as I could, she obviously was aware of what was going on but she was not in the crosshair. I started with stealing from our mother to make sure we had food and bills were paid, I got a part-time job at 13 because we couldn't rely on our mother and when I graduated I immediately got two jobs and we moved out. I had to push my sister through high school she wasn't an easy teen for obvious reasons, on top of going month to month trying to get as much money together to pay our bills. At 19 she finally graduated after being held back a year, she changed her tune a lot and she started working as well and had her own place when she was 21. I finally got a shot to do something for myself and got a degree, as a result I got a much better job but unfortunately that was right before the pandemic hit so I pretty much went from hired to fired as I was a new hire. Now the reason I am saying all that is not to pat myself on the back but to stress why my reaction is the way it is. I was out of work, on the brink of losing my apartment and only had one person who I expected I could turn to, my sister. She was recently married, lived still lives obviously, with her husband, so I asked if I could stay a few weeks at most a few months until I got a new job, it was a no. I was taken aback, but it remained to be a no. A week or two later I was kicked out of my apartment, I asked again and it was a no. At this point I am homeless and the only reason I didn't end up sleeping on the damn street was because I could crash at a few friends until I got a temporary job, I rented a room with a bunch of roommates for a while, eventually got a job in my field again and am now doing fine. That said, I have not spoken to my sister since, she has called, messaged, banged on my door, sent crying voice messages, apologized dozens of times, tried to explain herself, tried going to my job, tried going to friends, everything. I haven't said a word to her it's been over a year now, she recently had a child and she is still desperately trying to reach out. She claims her husband refused to let me stay, he even reached out several times to beg me to reach out, but to me the one time I need her she basically tells me to F myself, I feel like it was the last push I needed to just end that chapter of my life. I feel bad but just, not bad enough, I guess? Even my friends and my girlfriend are on my case that I should forgive her and that they understood it at first but now think I am being an asshole what would you guys do? Update. So I had a huge amount of people inquiring as to what ended up happening and asking me to make an update should anything happen and while I wasn't sure if I would or even should I eventually decided to just go ahead and do it. Let me start by apologizing to the people who commented on my post. I made my post and it didn't seem to gain much traction at all so I more or less stopped looking at it for about a day I think only to figure out the next day that I had gotten a lot of comments. Unfortunately when I decided to reply to a lot of the comments I had been reading I realized that this subreddit locks the comments after a certain amount of comments have been made or karma has been reached, I am afraid I was not aware of this admittedly very odd rule so that's on me. I did end up reading most comments and would like to thank everyone offering advice or just saying something supportive. First to answer a couple of questions that I was unable to answer along with addressing some incorrect comments in the previous post yet I saw asked quite a few times. 1. The first few no's were without reasonable explanation, I was not aware of her given reason that her husband was not okay with it until later. 2. She did not know she was pregnant when she declined and most of it happened before she would have even been pregnant in the first place. I mean most of this took place over a year ago, I even put that in the post so I am not sure how that math would even work. 3. I am not an anti-vaxxer or dirty or something, there were quite a few comments that theorized this would be the case for her refusal. I got my two vaccination shots the moment I could them and well while my personal hygiene is not exactly anyone's business I shower once a day and my apartment is spotless. 4. A lot of advice and comments seem to be from the perspective of functional families with a functional family structure, that is not the case here, the primary reason I am so gutted about this entire situation is exactly that, this isn't a case of well I don't want my cousin to stay in my house he can stay somewhere else. This is a case of me having sacrificed my entire youth and a significant portion of my early adult life for someone that I played no part in creating or have any parental responsibility for and the first and only time I ever asked her to do something for me as the only person I could reasonable fall back on and her not doing that, that's more than a familial spat, that is a straight up betrayal. That's also an answer to the people saying that she owes me nothing because I chose to be a parent. Anyway, with that out of the way, I decided to follow some advice given by several people. I told my girlfriend and the friends who involved themselves or were involved by my sister to back off or to lose my number, 
they do not understand my perspective and they likely never will and I need to get that through my head as I have a tendency to talk about my life as if it is a standard, but it is a standard only to me, luckily most people don't go through any of that. I obviously had a longer and face-to-face conversation with my GF and with individual close friends but it boils down to that. One friend kept pestering me about it and I ended up dropping him as a friend but my GF was apologetic and most friends were either apologetic or said they'd drop it. I ended up writing a long email to my sister and while I will not copy and paste the entire thing here as it contains a lot of personal information and far more horrible stuff that I am unsure will even be allowed on a sub like this it more or less boiled down to me explaining to her how her refusal to take me in for what ended up being a few weeks made me feel and I detailed a long list of things I had done to take care of her. I ended up finishing my email telling her that even if I take her version of the story as truth and her husband is the cause of me not being allowed to stay that it is entirely irrelevant to me, because that just means she didn't fight for me at all. I also informed her I have no interest in meeting her child as of this moment and I have no interest in reconnecting with her and if that changes in the future I will be the one to contact her, I told her to let this be a lesson to her as it has been a painful lesson to me. Boiled down I have decided to move on and keep the door on the tiniest of cracks. She has responded a lot since that moment. She seems unable to accept it, but I have not responded since. I don't have anything else to tell you I am afraid and since the sub only allows one update well it is what it is, again, thank you all for taking the time to respond to my post and thank you all for your insightful replies. I found my sister's mommy blog, and she's pretending to be me. I've been sitting on this all day and would really love some help here. My older sister June has been living with me, my husband Daniel, 39 meters, and our daughter Lee, 1.5F, since before Lee was born. She had to move in with us around March 2019 because she lost her job after a fight with her boss and couldn't find new work in her field, not many openings in our area. She'd been living with her long-term boyfriend before that, but they'd gotten into an argument of some sort, I don't know the details, and he ended up kicking her out. She'd had nowhere to go since we didn't have any family nearby. So I talked with Daniel and asked if she could stay with us until she got back on her feet. She could help me around the house since I was pregnant at the time. My husband works long hours and didn't like the idea of me being home alone, especially while pregnant so agreed saying it was a good idea. June had been very thankful for the place to stay and was a great help around the house. And an even bigger help after Lee was born. I still did slash do the bulk of the child care with Daniel right there to help when he's home. But it's nice to have someone else at home during the day to share the workload with. And Lee loves her Aunt Junie. The problem came today when I was looking up matching mommy and baby princess dresses since I was hoping for Lee and I to be matching queen and princess for Halloween this year. Yes I'm one of those people who plans costumes way ahead. Well I got sucked down the mommy blog rabbit hole and spent almost an hour looking through blogs and stuff until I saw a familiar kitchen. It was familiar because it was my kitchen. I know because I decorated my kitchen myself and it's a rustic sort of country theme and I have three antique copper jello molds my grandma gave me hanging on the wall next to the fridge. Plus I could see the treat bell I'd made for our kitty hanging on the fridge handle, she rings it when she wants a treat slash attention. I clicked on the picture and it took me to a mommy blog run by mommy, name super similar to mine. The more I scrolled through the blog the more disturbed I got. She had pictures of herself up in my house like it was hers. In one she was even wearing one of my blouses. Pictures of her and Lee all tagged mommy and daughter and even a couple pictures of her, Lee, and Daniel that I recognized. I've been in the photos but she'd apparently cropped me out of them. What do I do? How the hell do I even broach this? Hey sis, what's up with this blog of yours? Why are you pretending to be me? Why are you saying you're my daughter's mother? When did you have time to wear my clothes and pose for pictures with my child? What the fuck is going on? I put down all the info I could think of in my scrambled state right now. I don't think I missed anything. Any solid advice would be stellar. Thank you. Well the last almost year has been a lot to process and work through but a bunch of you nice redditors have been begging for an update, though I didn't want to do one until things calmed down. But now things have settled enough for me to do so, so here I am. This is a super long one so please bear with me. To start, June is no longer living with me and my family. First off, I sat Daniel down the next day and told him everything. I showed him the blog and he was incredibly disturbed by it and upset too. He didn't like how many photos of Lee were up online. We don't post many pictures of her and the ones we do are on our FBs, which are private, without our knowledge. He was worried if June was mentally okay because this was nuts to him and I said I wasn't sure but I was worried about her too. We agreed we needed to talk to her ASAP. So he took Lee to his parents' house to stay the night before coming back home. Then I contacted our parents for a video call and told them about June's blog I found. I felt like they needed to know what was going on. 
Our mom was shocked but our dad didn't believe it so I sent them a link to the blog. They were quiet while they looked through it, and I talked to them about how we, Daniel and I, were understandably weirded out and concerned for June. Out of them both dad looked the most disappointed while mom just looked stunned. I told them June couldn't stay here anymore because of this but we didn't want her out on the street, and they said she could come stay with them. They wanted to be there on call while we confronted June but I said all of us together would probably make her feel like she was being attacked so I said we'd call them afterwards but do the confronting alone. But they'd probably have to help remove her stuff afterwards. Then after hanging up with them I made sure I had my laptop there half shut with the blog open in case she tried to deny it. And I'd screenshotted slash recorded countless pages of the blog in case she tried deleting to rug sweep like some people warned me she might do. Which ended up being a good idea. When June sat down she asked what was wrong and I asked her if she had anything she'd like to come clean to us about. She's still my big sister and I love her, so I wanted to give her a chance to own up to this on her own. But sadly she said no so I told her I found her mommy blog. She was silent before saying she didn't know what I was talking about. So I opened my laptop and showed her the blog. She still tried to deny it and said it wasn't okay that I was blaming her for this when we didn't even know if it was her doing it. She said she'd never even seen this thing, the blog, before nor ever been to the site it was on. Daniel told her to get her laptop and they'd start typing in the blog URL and if no shortcuts appear then she was telling the truth, she'd never been to the site. But if one did come up? Well she was lying. She said we were being ridiculous but I insisted she get her laptop and just prove us wrong. If we were wrong then we'd apologize. She hemmed and hawed for a bit before reluctantly getting her laptop. I noticed she was gripping it really tight and after she opened it and signed and I guess she realized she was backed into a corner, so she just broke down into loud sobs. She started babbling out apologies and I asked her why she did this, why even fake being me and starting a blog. I asked if it was for money or something and she said no so I asked her to please explain to me why this was a thing she felt the need to do. She explained that she did it to feel happy and that she started it a little while after moving in with us. She said it wasn't fair that I had it all while she was old and unwanted. I told her she wasn't old or unwanted, we love her and so do our parents and so does the rest of her friends and family. She got angry and said it wasn't the same. And there was no way for me to understand what she's going through because I was everyone's favorite. I didn't know what she was talking about and said I wasn't everyone's favorite and that's when she exploded and said I was a blind asshole if I didn't see how everyone in our lives always prefers me over her. She claimed everyone loved me more and I always got what I wanted no matter what and I'll admit hearing that set me off. I told her that was actually not true? She was the oldest, and if we're being honest she always got what she wanted before me. Especially from our dad. I reminded her that he's bought her three cars over her adult life, a $2,000 laptop when she started college, and even paid off her first set of student loans for her. Meanwhile he never did any of that for me. I didn't get to attend college because I didn't have the money and didn't want loans because I wasn't sure I'd be able to pay them back on time. The closest I got to what she got was when our dad offered to sell me his old car for cheap and gave me his old laptop after he upgraded with a brand new one. I said I loved her but told her she had to see how delusional she was being if she thought I was somehow the favorite. I'll admit this was a sore spot for me. We got a little heated and argued back and forth so I told her she needed to pack her things because she couldn't stay here anymore. My trust in her was severely damaged and I didn't think her living with us any longer would be good for anyone. That's when she started bawling and begging me not to kick her out onto the streets. I told her she wasn't going onto the streets and she could just go stay with our parents. They live a couple hours away so it's not like she was going to be homeless. She kept crying and said she'd delete the blog if we let her stay. I refused and said she needed to go to therapy, not stay here. While we were talking, her trying to compromise and me rejecting it, she opened the blog and began deleting everything. She kept repeating through tears I'll delete it, I'll delete it. I'll get rid of everything and won't post anything else. As if to convince me to take back my decision. I made it clear through all of this that she was not staying here anymore no matter what she did. Once she deleted it she said we were all good now. It's gone. But I told her it didn't matter, she wasn't staying here. That's when she got pissed and said but I deleted it. There's no problem now. Like deleting it made it not happen. We told her to get ready because our parents were on their way to pick her up and they knew the situation. That caused her to start really flipping out. She was furious that I'd told our parents about the blog and said she wouldn't be able to look at our parents now. Things got messy and police were called by a neighbor because of just how loudly she was screaming. The cops arrived before our parents and she almost got taken into custody for being too aggressive and not settling down when the officer told her to calm herself the first time. So we had two cops there while she packed her stuff up. And then our parents arrived and it was just a very tense affair. 
I told her I loved her as she was leaving but she practically spat at me that she hated me. That hurt a lot. But I tried not to take it to heart. A few months passed and our mom kept me updated on how June was doing. Our parents said she needed to go to therapy, it was a condition of them letting her stay there. She started going and seems to be doing a lot better, but she still won't talk to me. Mom says she looks sad a lot but she also sounds remorseful when they talk about me slash my family. So I think the therapy is helping her come to terms with how not okay what she did was. And a couple months ago she finally got in contact with me, called and apologized for what she did, how she'd acted, and for saying she hated me. Talking with her felt nice. She sounded sad but happy too, much happier than she had when living with my family. Those who said she made the blog to cope were right. It turns out June was in a really not good place mentally after the breakup and being let go from her job, way more than she'd been letting on to anyone. She also told me she'd been on medication for anxiety and depression before slash during when she dated her ex but he'd shamed her for it and eventually he convinced her she didn't need them with him in her life, which was wrong. Turns out the argument that ended their relationship was him being mad at her for being such a downer and making him sad. Yeah. So after seeing her therapist she was put back on them and is doing much better she says. So things didn't end all happy sunshine but they didn't end as scarily as some people said they might. Which is more than good in my book. Thank you everyone for all your advice. It really helped. My parents tried to screw over my dying stepmother, blew up all of our lives instead. Throw away for obvious reasons. My, 17F, stepmother Jane is a wonderful, wonderful woman. She and my father got married when I was four, and she's been a rock in my life ever since. My mother was always my primary caregiver, but up until that point her relationship with my father was acrimonious and I basically never saw him. Jane was the reason they developed a stable co-parenting relationship, she encouraged everyone having a good relationship with each other and was always there to support me and my mom when things got rough. Jane was always a really hard worker. When she met my dad, he was living out of a hotel and my mother was doing everything in her power to keep me away from him because she was petty and angry that their relationship didn't work out. Meanwhile Jane had a great job, a nice house, helped my dad get back on his feet, negotiated a visitation schedule with my mom, who hated her for a long time and made sure my dad sent us money every week because neither one of them could afford an attorney to negotiate child support payments. Jane had no reason to do any of these things but as I got older she made it clear that she loved me as much as she loved my, half, brothers who were born a few years later. I even have my own room in her house because at the time we lived with my grandparents, various boyfriends of my mom and Jane felt that I needed a more stable environment than that. She's like the opposite of the evil stepmom. When I was 15, Jane won a big lawsuit against an airline company and got awarded upwards of a million dollars. She used the money to build sizable trust funds for me and my brother so that we would be taken care of later in life. Despite having a lot more money she still wanted to live a fairly modest life, so she paid off the house she has and has been living there ever since with my dad. Sure she bought a new car and they went on a few nice vacations but she didn't blow all her money on stupid things, which I respected. About a year ago, things started getting really weird. Whenever I saw Jane she seemed to look sicker and sicker, but no one would tell me or my brothers why even though I know they knew. All we knew is that she was at the hospital a lot. Around the same time, my mom has been coming around my dad a lot more and acting really strange, basically like she was trying to romance him. Whenever Jane was in the hospital my mother would insist on spending the night at their house and playing mom to my brothers, which was so weird to me because she never liked them or Jane. She'd be the perfect little housewife and my mom is not like that at all. It was super fake. Worst of all, my dad started falling for it. I'm not stupid, I'm pretty sure they were sleeping together. I tried to shield my brothers from it but they're not dumb either. I tried talking to my dad too but he insisted it wasn't like that. Then a few weeks ago, my mom started talking about all the places she'd like to visit, how she wanted a new car and was looking to invest. Which is weird because my mom has been a bartender her whole life and has lived paycheck to paycheck since before I was born. She was acting like she was about to get a lot of money, which started to make me really suspicious. Between Jane being sick and my mom acting all nouveau riche, I had a lot of questions. Finally I decided to visit Jane in the hospital and ask her about my trust fund. I found out that if anything happened to her, that my dad would inherit all the money including full control of the trust for me and my brothers. She asked me why I was so interested in the trust fund so I told her what's going on with my parents and how my mom has been acting with my dad. I didn't want to but after everything she did for me, she deserved the truth. It really hurt me to break her heart like that, especially once I found out that she was basically in hospice at this point because of irreversible kidney failure. She's only got a few more months. We both cried so much. 
Then, two days ago everything came to a head. My mom stormed in furious and started arguing with my dad. Apparently Jane met with her lawyer and changed the trust so that my dad would get nothing and all of the trusts would be controlled by my step-aunt. She demanded to know how Jane found out about their relationship and I came out and told them that I told Jane everything. I told them that if they wanted to play stupid games they would win stupid prizes and that I wasn't going to let them screw Jane over after all the help she gave my family when she didn't have to. My mom slapped me and my dad just looked so defeated. Then my mom told my dad that she didn't really love him, that she was just pretending to so he would marry her and she could get all of the money. The worst part about it is that my brothers witnessed the whole thing and now on top of their mom dying they have to deal with a cheating dad and his vindictive ex. Our whole family is in ruins and I feel like it's my fault even though I know it's not. Yesterday I visited Jane again and told her about the fallout. She apologized and said that she had to dissolve my trust fund to make sure my mother didn't get a hold of the money, but that is her oldest I will inherit the house slash property after she is gone and that's worth more than the other two trust funds combined. My father won't get anything because she's going to divorce him before she dies, and honestly I'm happy for her. She made me promise to take care of my brothers and told me that once I turn 18 this summer I can kick my dad out of the house if I want to. And I fully plan to do that btw. I haven't talked to my dad since and I can't even look at my mom. I can't believe they would conspire to do this to Jane after all this time. Just proof that they deserve each other and I'm embarrassed that they're my parents. Once I turn 18 I'm going to cut my dad out as much as I can and cut my mom out completely. I hope she rots. Meanwhile I'm going to try and be at the hospital as much as I can until Jane passes away. Anyways. I just needed to vent. I'm really messed up about the whole thing and I feel super betrayed, although I can't even begin to imagine how Jane feels. I'm gonna be so f-ed up when she dies. I can't even think about that right now. But at least she's not surrounded by people who just want to bring her down. Thanks for reading. My boyfriend wants to be polyamorous. We've been dating for 8 years, working together for 7 of those years. 5 of those we started our own business with another friend. In 2020, his father catches an illness. Beats it in January, transferred to a recovery home, due to malpractice passes away unexpectedly in March 2021. Boyfriend becomes distant for obvious reasons, I try to support him the best I can emotionally while running our business. Fast forward to October, he tells me he wants to go visit his friends a town over by himself. I think none of it but seeing he's trying to get back to his lively self. I get a call around 5 about how angry will you be if I do intimate stuff without you? I was a little upset since I felt left out but said sure. He kept texting me until 10, saying he'd be home in a bit. Then turns off his phone. He finally turns it back on at 7, makes an excuse about being too intoxicated to drive home and didn't feel like arguing. I'm livid. Not to mention it was our anniversary weekend. We talked it through. And moved on with the event in the back of my mind. November continued with him having weekends wanting to go out with friends but returning home on time. I couldn't shake my gut feeling. We go on a vacation just the two of us out of the country. He passed out from drinking with some strangers. I can't help myself and look through his phone. I miss you. Wish you were here. My stomach dropped and I resist all urges to smother him in his sleep. I confront him the next morning since he was too intoxicated to function. He accuses me of ruining the vacation. Why now? I felt betrayed and angry. He promised to never contact her again. She meant nothing. Less than a week goes by, and he tells me he needs to talk to her. They were just friends. He insisted. That they had connected over his father's death and she had been emotionally supporting him. I suggest us going to couple therapy, he immediately shoots it down. I told him to do whatever he wanted since he couldn't keep a simple promise with someone that meant nothing. I had fallen into a horrible depression and went to the doctor to get some meds before I hurt myself. Few weeks go by and he brings up he wants us to have an open relationship with her. Hell no. While it wasn't the first time he brought up an open relationship the thought of her in my life revolted me. He continues to harass me for the next few months until I finally agree in June due to an ultimatum. Polyamorous or I continue to cheat on you. I can't be monogamous. I immediately regretted opening the door. He begins spending more time with her. Going on trips. We continue to distance. He begs me to meet her, to give her a chance, I do. Nothing changes. He finally realizes our business is not doing well due to his negligence. Plans to start helping more and scheduling properly to assure we are all getting the proper time. Similar to how most people complain, getting home late to stare at his phone, really didn't count as spending time with me. I find out from a friend that he had taken her to dinner with friends. Supposed to be a secret. I confront him over the phone since I'm out of town. He said it didn't mean anything but I felt hurt. We talk it through before hanging up he asks, how mad will you be if I take her to see my uncle? I hang up on him not wanting to continue to fight. He opened yet another door, now family. By September, I had enough. I told him I was tired of being ignored, toxic and depressed. He asked if I had found someone new. I just didn't want to continue being in a poly relationship with people that had betrayed me. I felt a third will in my own relationship. He begged me once again, new plan. I agree with the exception that we go to couples therapy. Month goes by, still no therapy. I've had enough and bring it up again. 
I wanted him out of my house, I wanted us to break up unless he left her. He brings up the reason he's with her is because I don't. Provide him with what he needs, to be desired and intimate. We'd always struggled with him in the past. Our drives are completely the opposite. We talk, we hash out a plan. Again. Final straw. Her or me. I wanted to work on us, rebuild our relationship, find each other. Be happy. He agreed but that it needed to be next time he saw her that he didn't want to do it over okay. They had plans to go to Halloween. I show interest in what they are doing since he's going to be gone Friday and Saturday. He asks me if I want to come that it'd be nice if I get along with her. I snapped. It's been two months of me telling him I feel like I'm on thin ice over our situation. He said he didn't realize he had a timeline to break up with her. I asked him what would be a good date for him then. He said end of January after their cruise. I felt defeated. I asked him if he couldn't stay with me while he was with her that he needed to find his own place. I'm done. I give up. I stared into space as he muttered these while packing. You are throwing me away. I'm sorry I exist. I didn't realize I meant nothing to you. If I'm not with you, I'm leaving her too good luck tonight. I'm going to go cry myself to sleep. After a week, I caved. Let him back home. Couldn't stand him saying he was homeless. I feel empty now when I'm with him. I made it clear I didn't want the person who triggers my betrayal trauma in my life but he's adamant I won't like the next person he finds. We started talking again. Holidays are coming up. She's upset since she's unsure if he's going to spend them with her. His birthday is coming up. Asked him what he wanted. Said it'd be nice if all three of us could get lunch or dinner. I told him, if I did, to be 100% clear, still doesn't mean I want them in my life. I'd like to run away. But feel trapped due to our business and life. I do still somewhat love him but right now I feel numb. If I let myself feel, I know he's just going to hurt me. The constant. Roller coaster has been hell. I know I don't want Polly but it's hard to leave someone you've built a life with. My narcissistic ex-boyfriend poisoned me over a LinkedIn bio, but he accidentally gave me a golden ticket to Harvard. Basically my high school rival was a guy named Nathan. He and I were super similar, we were co-presidents of the same clubs, had similar academic portfolios, had done research papers together, and we spent a lot of time together, so despite being known as academic enemies, Nathan and I were actually in a relationship for two years of high school. Now those were years that I really valued and enjoyed. Nathan took pretty much all my firsts, but, once the time for college applications rolled around, Nathan dumped me saying that he needed to focus if he wanted to get into Harvard and he couldn't be distracted with me. This made me upset for a number of reasons, mainly because he called our two-year relationship a distraction but also because Harvard was also my dream school, and I didn't appreciate the way Nathan just assumed he would get in over me. And so, just like that, our academic rivalry was back and we each had something to prove. But I never could have prepared myself for the lengths Nathan would go to, just to beat me. Everything went downhill at this debate competition, a four-day international conference in D.C. that we had been preparing for all year. This was the final big competition before college applications were due and our final chance to prove that we belonged at an Ivy League school. Everyone was tense, not just me and Nathan, and everyone wanted to win. But wanting to win will never excuse what Nathan did, even though I'm incredibly grateful for it, because his stupidity changed my life drastically for the better. It first started on the train to DC when Nathan changed seats so that we would be next to each other. It was a little awkward, but I thought that this was just Nathan's way of trying to apologize for all the unpleasant tension between us, so I let my guard down and didn't think anything suspicious of it. For the remainder of the trip, Nathan tried acting like a friend. That train ride, he treated me like he used to. We spent time studying together, laughed over some inside jokes, and we even practiced our speeches in front of each other. I started to think this competition would be good for us, to make him realize that we couldn't lose our friendship over just school, and dare I say give our relationship another shot. By the end of the train ride, things almost felt normal, and it felt almost natural when Nathan showed up to my hotel room the next morning with a cup of coffee for me. Him getting me breakfast while I was running late really felt like progress, especially since that was something we used to do for each other when we were still together. It even made me start daydreaming about maybe even being in a relationship with him again. All felt right in the world, that was until I noticed something had changed in me. About halfway through the first day of the conference, I felt like I was in a hyper-focused mode, as if someone had filtered out the white noise in my brain and just left the sharpest, most productive parts behind. When I gave impromptu speeches, I found myself having extra time to think as if time was going by slightly slower than usual. And when the time for questions came, I asked the most precise, detail-oriented questions that highlighted major flaws in my opponent's arguments. Unfortunately, Nathan fell into this category. Somehow, I was beating everyone in the debate room, including him. By the second night, it was obvious that I was going to win. I was just hoping this wouldn't cause a rift in our friendship because we were just starting to become close again. But all my concerns melted away because the next morning, Nathan came to my room and gave me a morning coffee to prep me for the day, even though he was somewhat agitated. So three days in a row, Nathan brought me coffee, competed against me during the day, and chilled at night. But on the fourth and final day of the competition, everything was even more tense than usual. My anxiety only grew when Nathan failed to deliver me a morning coffee. I tried not to think anything of it initially because it could have just been a coincidence, but then, Nathan didn't show up to the debate at all. He completely skipped the final day of the competition. That's when I knew something was wrong. I ran to his hotel room the second the committee session ended. After banging on his door for five minutes straight, he finally let me in, 
but the moment I stepped inside, Nathan exploded at me, asking how it was possible for me to be performing so well. I was going to make some light-hearted joke because I genuinely had no idea how I managed to improve so much in just four days. Everything that happened during this conference put all my other work these past four years to shame, which was saying a lot since my senior year was the best I had ever performed. But I never got a word out, because Nathan immediately went on a chauvinistic, narcissistic tangent and revealed something truly insane, he had been trying to sabotage me from the very first day. Apparently he felt that this competition was the perfect thing to round out his application, and he really really wanted it on his LinkedIn biography so he could call himself an international debate champion, and so he had played dirty to try to win. What I thought was old friends catching up over a cup of coffee was actually Nathan giving me lace coffee to make me lose the competition. At least that's what he thought. Nathan told me that he had tried to intentionally buy me coffee with psychedelics and legal psilocybin alternatives in it, hoping that it would make me loopy, distracted, and confused. But I knew the coffee he had given me was the opposite of psychedelic, if anything, it was focus enhancing, and I felt ultra productive. I asked Nathan for the exact coffee brand he had bought and looked it up to, confirm what I already knew, that the psychedelic coffee he bought had nothing to do with psychedelics. It was simply a mushroom coffee fusion blend. It was called Clarity Brew, and from the name I could sort of understand why Nathan might think that it was for a psychedelic type of clarity, but the actual product description made it clear that this coffee was a blessing, not a curse. The mushrooms Nathan had thought would hurt my chances of winning this competition were chaka mushrooms and lion's mane, which botanists will know are just cognitive power banks for the mind. I respected Nathan wholeheartedly until this point, but never in my life did I think that he would be capable of such a low-level Sigma IQ move. And even though Nathan had basically tried to poison me with his coffee, it worked so well on me that once I was done yelling at him, I took the clarity brew with me to confiscate it, only to bring it all the way home so I could continue using the coffee until the end of senior year. That was when I discovered that the coffee didn't just make me more productive, it gave me long-lasting energy and naturally minimized the jittery effects of caffeine. Nathan had basically bought me super coffee in an attempt to drag me down. To no one's surprise, I won the competition and was later accepted to Harvard, Nathan was not. We still text sometimes, and he's apologized a lot for what he did. I've even started connecting him to a few people at Harvard to help him out with some research opportunities because I just want to be the bigger person here. Hopefully one day, he'll be the same way. Edit. Okay wait, thanks so much for all the comments, I think you guys are right about him just using me for networking. I've decided to block Nathan and cut contact with him permanently, because you're right, he lost the privilege of being my friend the day he tried to drug me. Though yes, I still do take clarity brew. Hotel harasser and attempted window breaker. I have the worst luck, and a good bit of traumatic experiences I've dealt with throughout my life. 2022 was no different, and the year started out awful when the heat lamp for my pet frog caught on fire and started a nasty fire in my bedroom. Due to the smoke damage throughout the house, and me having nowhere to sleep, my parents and I were put into a two-bedroom suite at a residence inn in the next town over, a quiet mid-sized town with little to no crime while the house was gutted and renovated. We lived in this hotel from January 5 late October. It's actually a town known for being a more wealthy, stuck-up type. The hotel was nice, but I am used to living in a pretty woodsy and rural neighborhood where I don't hear too much going on. I'm not used to apartment living, but having access to a pool, hot tub, fire pit, and nice propane outdoor kitchen that people rarely used was very nice. About a month after the fire, I ended up getting a part-time job five minutes away from the hotel and started dating my coworker. The story starts with my boyfriend and I getting out of work around 12 a.m., and then hanging out with our friend until we decided to all head home at around 12.50. My mom texts me asking where I am, which I didn't reply because I would be there in less than five minutes and was driving and she would probably see me before I could even enter the hotel through the door near our room because most nights she would stand out there on the phone with a friend, or on Facebook, drinking a truly and chain smoking. She mainly did this because she's a night owl, like me, and the walls inside the hotel room were like paper. My dad had to get up every morning at 5am for work and we would both give her crap for talking on the phone late at night with friends or watching videos as no matter what volume she talked at, we could hear her. When I pulled into the parking spot, I walked up to my mom and she started telling me off for not replying to her quickly enough because something was going on. I asked her what happened, because of course we already had witnessed some weird behavior at the hotel before. Basically, when she had gotten home, due to most of the parking spaces up against the building being taken, she parked in the overflow lot for the hotel and a car that was sitting there peeled off as soon as she went in park, with her lights off. She went inside, dropped off her purse and other items, and went outside to smoke and noticed the same car was again parked next to her idling. She told me she had been standing there, drinking her drink, leaning up against the wall, watching TikTok on her phone when she heard footsteps approaching. She looked up and there was a man there who was staring at her, and she stared back. He ended up walking a little bit down the walkway, and then raised his fist up at a first floor window and smacked it, possibly attempting to break it? My mom, who unfortunately is not afraid of anything but spiders, yelled hey! What the flip are you doing? And he said something about trying to open a beer bottle. He had no bottle in his hand, and alarm bells were going off for my mom so she just yelled okay, I'm calling the cops. And he started sprinting down the side of the building away from her and around the corner. My mom started to follow him once he rounded the corner of the building, and when she got to the corner he was gone. There was an older couple, probably late 50s or early 60s who would frequently sit on the curb by that door that he rounded the corner on drinking, and the woman asks my mom what she thinks is up with that guy, and my mom was like I have no clue, did you see him doing anything? 
and the lady then told my mom that he had sat down with them for like an hour basically being like oh, I have nowhere to stay tonight, I have nowhere to go, I have no money. And was trying to convince them to let him stay in their hotel room. Tonight. She basically said he was acting cracked out of his mind. Only like 30 seconds has passed, when my mom hears his car start and he peels out of the overflow lot again, this time lights on. She walks back over to the door closest to our room, and continues smoking. Not even three minutes later, he pulls into the overflow lot again, and starts walking down the walkway, and passes my mom, staring at her. My mom said something like this is getting flipping ridiculous. I'm going to call the cops on you. And he just said okay? And kept walking past her. This is at the point where I had pulled into my parking spot and my mom was telling me all of this. I hear footsteps in the parking lot, and I see a tall man in khaki shorts and a hoodie walking into the overflow lot and my mom is telling me that's him. That's him. So I take a video of him in case I need evidence or something. He had apparently been walking around the building again, then got in his car and left again. My mom had called the non-emergency number because we were on the ground floor and she didn't want him trying to come back and break one of our windows for our room. The police department is actually across the street from the hotel and they said they would come by and take a look yet no one has come. Due to the fire, I have a hard time sleeping and at the time wasn't on medication yet, so I used weed to help me get tired and a bit less anxious for bed, PTSD from the fire, fire started while I was sleeping, it sucks, I decided to go to the door on the other side of the building, which was a bit more sheltered and also because I didn't want my mom to see me smoking marijuana, even if she knew I was doing it, it felt weird to be doing it in front of her. I sit down on the curb of the walkway and light up, texting my boyfriend about all of this when I hear the car door close behind me. I look out into the lot and don't see any headlights or anything, but I'm not too worried because. Again, it's a hotel, lots of people get dropped off and come by late at night. I start scrolling through Twitter and hear a loud roar. From a man. I get up, already shaking, and look around. And I see his Volkswagen Golf parked about 10 feet away from me. The lights in the car are on, and there's a bunch of smoke in the car. He's rooting through crap in his backseat, making sounds like a flipping animal and just talking gibberish. I immediately call my mom and start walking down to the other end of the building where she is, and she's looking at me head on and tells me to run through the phone and don't look back. Apparently at that point he was walking behind me, quickly. By the time I get to her, I turn around and he's already walking back. I'm so shaken my mom said F this and called 911 this time, because it's now been around 35 minutes and no officer has come from just calling the police department. An officer comes 10 minutes later, which I recorded on my phone, and tells us that she actually had responded to the first call, and at that point he had gone to an ATM, gotten cash, and bought a room for the night at our hotel. She said she personally talked to him herself. She has a bit of an attitude with my mom, I'm now listing this completely based off of the recording, who after my mom had said do you not see the odd behavior. And the cop literally when it's not illegal to have odd behavior, ma'am. He is a guest here. And my mom says he's acting like he's on drugs. And the cop said he may be. It's not illegal to be on drugs, it's only illegal to possess them. I can't if he's high, it's only if he's possessing them that I can take criminal action. To which my mom replies, well clearly if he's high he's most likely got drugs in his possession, don't you think? The cop then basically said she understood my mom's concerns, and while his behavior is a little bizarre, the attempted window smashing is a he said she said, and because he is. Now a paying guest she cannot go against the matter any further and leaves. My mom and I are inside for the night in our room, and in my bedroom I kept the window cracked because the AC wasn't the best and I heard him walk around the building time and time again until I eventually fell asleep. When I woke up around 7am, he was gone. I have so many other creepy stories staying at this place, and it really is shocking if you knew what town it was. I would witness drug deals going down at 3 a.m. when we first started staying there and I lived on the third floor, people engaging in affairs, etc. One night I had gone over to my aunt's house, which was about 35 minutes away, and on the way home had a friend on the phone to keep me company. I pulled into a parking spot right at the door, and it was around 9.30 p.m. I was just sitting there for about 5 minutes when I saw a man's silhouette walking down the walkway slowly, coming closer to my car. I didn't think much of it because people walk their dogs a lot at night, or go out to smoke. But then he slowed way down as he got to my car and stood directly in front of the hood, staring at me through the windshield. I stared back but I couldn't see anything besides the black silhouette and the end of the cigarette lid and just said to my friend uh, there's a guy just standing. Like right outside my car staring at me. And she yelled text your dad. Text your dad right now. I'm assuming he had heard my friend, because he then swiftly walked around the corner and disappeared. My dad came running down the stairs, bless him because at that point we were on the third floor, and by the time he had come running out the man was gone. At that point, my parents wouldn't even let my out at the pool and hot tub area by myself anymore because they noticed that the hotel was being used for human trafficking slash intimacy work with pimps and so on. They wanted me to text them as soon as I arrived at the hotel and not dilly-dally in. The parking lot, just get inside and keep a close eye on my surroundings. Again, really surprising for that area. I'm thankful I'm back in my house, where the only sounds I hear at night are bears or raccoons trying to root through my trash, and I hope I never have to live in a hotel ever again. My father won't stop calling me a fatty. My father continuously makes fun of my body and won't listen when I ask him to stop. To start things off with a few side notes I am very insecure about my body and have been since a child. I do train. I do eat right but it's just an issue that will forever haunt me. My stomach is a bit plump and my thighs are pretty large. My body is covered in stretch marks from God knows where. I have been teased about this in school to the point of dropping out due to mental health and trauma. The rumors got out of hand. 
It started with my body then it went to me apparently sleeping with everyone in school. They bragged about the thickness of my thighs, how fun it apparently was to grab the skin on my hips. How the marks made them feel superior because they looked like scars. The only person who knew was a so-called best friend who ended up getting jealous that I managed to pull a date. That was the only reason. It hurt a lot but by the time she confessed I was already down low. To the point of nearly ending it all. My teachers even laughed in my face when I went to them for help because my parents brushed me off. The only thing that was holding me together with sparkly glitter glue was that godsend of a date who I am still with today. He always assures me that my body is perfect to him but I could never truly believe it. I could never shake away those memories and I can't shake away the comments from my own father. The person who I looked up to and respected. My father has always been a joking person. Always finds a way to lighten up a room but now, I don't think I can ever see him the same again. He knows how I feel about my body, he has always supported me and encouraged me to train if I really wanted to but now I feel like it was just an act. I don't know what to think or feel. I don't know if I'm overreacting or not. About a year ago the comments started. They were innocent at first so I brushed it off his jokes. Then came the hip. Pinching. The stretch mark dad jokes. The remarks about wearing tire pants to hide my oversized legs. It really hurt. I couldn't deal with it at the time so my aunt, who I consider as a mother, took matters into her own hands. It stopped for a while. Until a few months ago. I was slowly getting comfortable with my body again and decided to wear shorts for the first time in a long time when we went to visit my parents. I had my back turned while talking to my mother. My stomach dropped when I felt the pinch on my thighs. I knew what was coming. He said what's with this? I thought you diet. And he jiggled the skin of my thigh, emphasizing what he was referring to. I couldn't stop the sob and I just left. My partner didn't know what was happening when I pulled him to the car and asked him to drive home. I was a mess. That night he just held me and I was grateful for his presence. All the memories started coming back by that single joke. He still found ways to comment on my body but I forced myself to ignore it and act unbothered. That brings us to three days ago. It's nearing my birthday so my mother and I were discussing an outfit to get me. She wanted to personally look for something so she needed my measurements in which I gave her. She was using my dad's phone as she has a bad streak of luck with breaking hers. My dad then started. He asked me why my waist was so wide. Why my hips were so high. Why I wasn't proportioned right. If I was sure I measured in cm instead of him. I went along with it because I wanted to at least try to be the better person but I failed. I broke when he told me that I will never be able to fit into any of the outfits my mother showed me. It's pointless and I should just cut holes into a bag and wear that to my birthday party instead because it's the only thing that I will fit in. He didn't stop there no. He said it needed to be long enough to make me look at least normal. I dropped my phone at that point, sobbing. I couldn't stop and. Again my partner just held me, whispering reassuring words throughout my breakdown. I ended up trying to talk to him. Trying to get him to stop but he just brushed me off like my school days. He told me he was only joking and I need to stop being so serious. That I can't help my body turned out the way it did. The worst part about it was they visited me today and I had to act fine because we had other guests over. It didn't take long for the jokes and pinching to start. In front of everyone. He pinched my thigh when I walked past. He pinched my stomach, my hips. He said that I'm getting bigger because of my stretch marks that he apparently never knew were there. He asked if I was mad at him but all I could do was plaster on a smile because I couldn't say anything. I was on the brink of bursting into tears. When they were leaving, he tried to joke around and pinch me again. I managed to choke out please stop and he told me to stop being dramatic and accept that it's a joke. My partner is not happy about it but I asked him not to intervene. I am appreciative that he is here for me but I cannot handle a fight right now. He's been trying to cheer me up, showing me cute outfits, saying how nice I will look in them and all other stuff but I can't bring myself to let it go. I know it's not his fault and I'm wrong for not wanting him to step in but right now I just need a hug. Am I overreacting? I told my parents I'm gay to avoid their arranged marriages. They then try to set me up with men. So I'm pretty straight, maybe slightly bi if we count femboys. Let's get that out of the way first. I'm also an Indian American male around 26 years of age. I'd also like to clear up some misconceptions around arranged marriage. A lot of non-Indians seem to think it's literally your parents choose who you marry and that's that, but that's not really the case. Instead it's more like your parents tap their network to find potential partners for you, if you like each other's picks then you guys meet in person and then you decide whether or not you want to get married. So basically your parents are tender and you get a meeting or two to decide whether or not you want to get married. It's not quite as bad as many of you think it is, but the whole process feels super rushed and I'd rather date someone before I figure out if we're compatible or not. Anyways, my parents have recently been getting on my case about getting married. Apparently I'm getting older, need to settle down and give them grandchildren or something like that. Basically every time I see them, which is fairly often since they live close by, they have a new potential match for me, a picture of some new girl and ask me if I'd be willing to meet her. It's honestly super annoying, but I'm too non-confrontational to really put my foot down and say I don't want an arranged marriage, after all if I do there'd be an argument or at minimum some interrogation about why I don't want one. Anyways, I was thinking of ways I could get them to stop harassing me about getting married and the idea and the title popped up in my head. I decided it'd be a lot easier to just come out as gay than to explain why I didn't want an arranged marriage. 
My parents were fairly conservative but weren't the types to disown their kids, and if I just said I was gay I'd have a solid reason to not get an arranged marriage, I didn't like girls. So that's what I ended up doing last time I was visiting. They were showing me pictures of some girl and I just looked them in the eyes and said mom, dad, I'm gay. They got really quiet and awkward and asked me if I was sure and I said yes. My mom told me they'd love me no matter what and to do what makes me happy. My dad was a lot more awkward and quiet but later gave me a similar talk about how he was a bit uncomfortable with the idea, but recognizes that times are changing and I should do what makes me happy. Overall I did feel kinda bad because of how genuinely my parents seemed to respond to me, but was happy with the result, they stopped giving me arranged marriage proposals and stopped showing me pictures of girls. That is until last weekend. I visited them as usual and was greeted by my mom who was more excited than usual. She sat me down and pulled out a binder with a bunch of pictures of guys. Apparently my parents had spent the last month or so looking for any and all gay Hindu Indian men who I could potentially marry. So now I guess I'm dealing with the exact same shit but instead of being greeted with pictures of cute Indian girls I get to see pictures of gay Indian dudes instead. Fuck my life lol. At this point the plan is to either find a girlfriend and tell my parents she totally turned me straight or maybe marry a twink or SMTHN Ike. Update. Hey everyone. I don't know if you remember me but, I'm the dude who came out as gay to avoid an arranged marriage. Anyways, I have an update for you guys. I read all the comments on the original post, from the people telling me to just tell my parents, questioning whether or not I was really straight, laughing at the admittedly fairly funny situation I'd gotten myself into and a couple of people who were straight up mean. At the end of the day though posting here probably gave me the final push to do something. The weekend after I'd made the post, I visited my parents as always and resolved myself to tell them the truth. However when I got there my mom has always pushed the binder in my hands and I kinda lost my resolve to tell her. I decided to just play along. It was then that I remembered the people on this thread who made fun of me for liking femboys and questioned whether or not I was really straight. I kinda took that to heart and decided to look at the binder of dudes in earnest to see if I'd any of them. TBH I'm really glad I did. Most of the dudes were unattractive as expected, but I found a dude on there who I legitimately think is cuter and more feminine than the vast majority of girls I've seen. I told my mom I liked him and she kinda joked around asking me what the point of being gay is when I wanted a dude who looked like a girl anyways. She talked to his parents, we had a meeting set up over Zoom and overall it went really well. Me and him have a bunch of common interests, we're both massive weebs and history nerds, and he also disclosed that he apparently cross-dressed in private which only made me like him more. In the end though we both decided we didn't want to rush into marriage and wanted to do a dating trial run of sorts. I told my parents and. They were fine with IT. My dad literally just told me that as long as we have marriage as an eventual goal and don't have sex before marriage they didn't mind if we dated. Y'all literally this whole shit show could have been avoided LMFAO, though I'm kinda glad it wasn't. Luckily he lived in the same state as me, but he was still a 3-4 to four hour drive away, so mostly we've just had discord calls and spent time together gaming for the past few weeks. This Saturday though we finally managed to meet up in person and have a date and honestly I think I'm kinda in love. Dude's cuter than any girl I've ever met but unlike most girls he's actually into the same things I am. Anyways we ended up having a great day out on Saturday and I ended up staying at his place over the weekend, though surprisingly I kept my promise to my dad and somehow avoided having sex lol. Anyways yeah I'm now back home and extremely happy with my decision to lie to my parents, then again is it really lying if it turned out to be true? I really really do like him and will probably ask him to marry me a couple months from now if nothing goes wrong. Guess I really was gay all along. I took in a lazy homeless person and he's ruined me and my family's lives, I don't know how to get rid of him. My husband and I allowed a veteran friend of ours who we've known for 20 years to move in with us. When we talked about him coming, I let him know I'd give him 2-3 to three months to get settled and get a job then he would need to pay 500 bucks a month for rent. When he moved in he was super happy and grateful, saying he was going to find work very fast and was doing good, going for walks and trying to actively lose weight. Our friend is at least 450 to 550 pounds, mid-50s, diabetic and had not gone to the doctor in years. We fed him dinner every night and I even fed him if we got food out at a restaurant or fast food. I offered him a beer after he made mention that he hadn't had one in a really long time and missed it. I said we really don't drink much so help yourself. Maybe two months go by and I have a particularly hard day, so I go to grab a drink and notice my entire liquor cabinet with probably $300 to $600 worth of alcohol is gone. He drank everything, including my high-quality whiskey I was hiding because you can't buy it anymore, as well as the bottle of champagne we were saving for my husband's graduation. I confront him and he cries saying he's embarrassed and so sorry. I ask what gave him the idea that help yourself meant drink everything. 
he doesn't have an answer besides blaming his back issues and then his emotional trauma. I put my foot down and tell him this was it, it's been seven months and he hasn't found a job, we're hurting for money and he needs to start paying rent. He agrees. Three months go by and nothing. He just sits in his room, uses his food stamps to buy candy and junk food from Amazon and the store, gained 100 pounds, his diabetes is so bad his skin is bursting open and his legs are so swollen, his wounds won't heal for months but he won't get up. He does nothing but sit on his computer all day every day. The rest of us leave for work or school. I remind him he needs a job now. If you cook or come out to have a meal and watch television he comes out and talks your ear off about whatever he's obsessed with at the time and his opinions that are kinda outdated. If I walk over there, I hear him say things like women shouldn't be able to vote or let's send all the immigrants in America to Gaza. It's so bad I avoid doing anything down there now. My husband is having health problems and we end up finding out he's got stage 4 kidney and lung cancer after he collapses one day. As I was working two jobs still, as well as my kids being in school I asked said roommate to use our snow blower to clear our sidewalks and driveway. He went out for three minutes, then came back and saying his back hurt and he couldn't do it, and came back in. My husband ends up going out and doing it. He did it every day with only the help of myself or our 14-year-old. I'm pissed and tell him it's bullshit he can't even help with that since he's living rent-free. My husband ends up having part of his kidney removed, he only has one, and is told not to lift over 10 pounds for six weeks. Rumi doesn't help with poop. My mother-in-law says she's coming to stay with us for a few months right after his surgery, so we give him notice that he needs to be gone within three months. Roommate has a breakdown crying telling me husband that isn't enough of a notice, and that he is getting the SHT end of the stick. I'm so pissed he actually said this to my husband and reminded him that most landlords only give 30-day notice so he's really lucky. We gave him a move-out date of July 30th. He's still here. My mother-in-law had to change her flight three times now because we had nowhere to put her. He told us three move-out dates that came and went. We now told him he needs to be out by the end of the month or we're moving mother-in-law in his room, she hates him, he has told us he will just go live on the streets, but I told him no. He had months notice this was happening. And did literally nothing till last week. Now he's waiting on a background check to go through so he can go to the men's shelter, and the Catholic Church is helping him too. He's pretty much disabled so I offered a year ago to help him apply for disability, he told me he had a caseworker helping him apply. Come to find out that was a lie. He didn't want to apply for it because it would affect his retirement. Apparently he hasn't worked for six years and was living off our other friend that entire time too. There is so much more to this, but as of now I don't see an end in sight. I'm uncomfortable in my own home, my downstairs living room, my kitchen and common areas down there are a huge mess and he doesn't even bother to do his own dishes or clean up his mess. I can't wait for him to leave and at this point I am so resentful of him I feel guilty he is going to a homeless shelter, but at the same time I have zero desire to ever see him again and feel our friendship is done. He keeps asking if he can just move to our garage or basement and doesn't understand that I cannot support him anymore and don't want him there. He's at my house 365 days a year every hour of the day, in my air conditioning, using my Wi-Fi, water, heat, fridge, washing machine, etc. using utilities with no break. My utilities are at minimum 100 bucks a month more than before he moved in, and let's not even talk about food. I just want this over and him gone. It's caused problems in my marriage and in my family. I now never want to help anyone with anything like this ever again. I have helped a lot of people in life and it's always bitten me in the behind. I just need him to go. My scumbag aunt ripped off my grandma for years, so I put my nose in her business and had the IRS ruin her. My grandma was getting old, late 80s slash early 90s. She had one wish, to not die in a senior home. Easily done as my grandpa sold some assets way back when, then invested the money and let it ride for 30 plus years, he never touched it and collected a pension. Way back when my grandpa died, my grandma appointed my dad, this SHD aunt and my uncle as the trustees of the trust. Basically the trusted advisors for her and her care for the foreseeable future. All was well in the beginning, then my dad moved further away and couldn't take care of the day-to-day -day upkeep as the trustee and to see that my grandma was okay. My aunt told her that she and my uncle could take over and all would be fine. It was fine for a while. A few times my dad went back to visit and noticed my grandma didn't always have overnight care or that her mail wasn't picked up and the driveway wasn't plowed. She also lost her cable TV and newspaper subscription. My dad figured it just lapsed so he had the services put back on. My dad also noticed my grandma was eating moldy food at times because her truck was sold and she had no transportation, she drove up to 90 years old. She basically just chilled at the house alone and did crossword puzzles. The craziest part of this is that my aunt only lived two miles from my grandma, but my grandma told my dad she saw my aunt only once a month on Saturday for about one hour. As with the elderly in age, my grandma passed away. She did get her wish and was able to die in her own home. Upon her death things started to get real interesting. Once the probate lawyer got her children around the table some shady business started to come out. My aunt Rebecca asked that everyone just forego any audit or paperwork and they just sell the house and divide up the remaining back account balance. So just signing on the line, each sibling was to get a check for $200,000, not too bad of. An inheritance. My dad thought that was somewhat a little rushed. 
He said at the time that he wanted to wait because my grandma's house was easily in the $600,000 range based on size and location. My aunt exploded in his face, cursing at him and calling him all kinds of names because he was unwilling to sign the assets then and there. She basically wanted a quick close while everyone looked the other way. My dad ended up leaving the room after the screaming and the deal wasn't signed that day. It took nearly six months before another appointment and they were all back at the table. The thing is though, when you are a trustee and the person dies, the funds and access to financial accounts are all under heavy scrutiny until all beneficiaries are made aware and sign the final papers. At the next meeting, my dad went in there with no intention to sign the deal. He got his brother to agree that they audit the entire accounts going back five years. When they demanded this again at the meeting with the lawyer, my aunt ended up arguing that a forensic audit would cost $5,000 and it's a waste, like what difference does it make? Two beneficiaries requested it, so it was what was going to happen. The audit report showed up about three months later. Here is where it gets good. My dad began looking over the audit report and saw it was full of holes, like excessive monthly food costs for a 90-year-old lady. Payments made for car services for a car my grandma no longer had. Many different things and there just didn't add up. My dad asked me to give the audit a second look, so I spent a Saturday night going over it, and here is some crazy stuff I found. Costco monthly food costs of $1,100 $2,000 for the last four years. Telephone bills for six cell phones. Gasoline for a truck my grandma didn't have for years at easily $400 per month. House repairs were paid to my aunt's husband who owned a construction business. Some of the house repairs were like $16,000 for a new roof, new garage doors, home security. System all at inflated prices. Grandma paid for my aunt to go to Europe twice on vacation. My grandma was paying my estranged aunt Becky a stipend of $2,000 a month for the last five years, as well as her deadbeat son for $2,500. Every month they were paid. All grandkids were to be paid a lump sum of $10,000 upon their 30th birthday as that is when the $50 check from grandma stopped for all grandkids. Guess who was paid out? her kids and my estranged aunt's kids, but not me or my siblings. My grandma gave loans to my aunt Rebecca for her husband's construction business in return for equity in the company, which amounted to nothing. These loans totaled about $200,000 over three years, right around when the housing bust happened. They also sold her assets like jewelry for cash, because some big ticket items simply vanished from her house. Armed with all this information, the next probate meeting was interesting. In the time between my grandma's death and the third probate meeting, my aunt's construction business filed for bankruptcy so that $200,000 in equity grandma used to have had simply vanished. The probate lawyer was also somewhat concerned and made it obvious that this was fraud and breach of fiduciary duty, where my aunt could actually get real prison time. After this, the negotiations were much more favorable. My aunt got nothing, literally zero, my other aunt only received $25,000 after all the stipend payments. My father and uncle shared the rest, after all grandkids received the $10,000 payout. The house sold at the first offer for $520,000. That was the regular revenge for any treacherous beach that ripped off grandma and had her eating moldy food. Here is the pro. My aunt probably felt pretty bad that she couldn't supplement her lifestyle with grandma's money anymore, but that was the least of her worries. Since she tried to personally rip me off for $10,000, I took it personally. I don't care how tough you are, the IRS is the scariest thing that can happen to a person, nobody wants to have their money forcibly removed. I did a little research, photocopied my documents, had them notarized and sent off to the IRS. I felt like it went nowhere, then maybe 18 months later I was notified and asked to come to the IRS building for an appointment in my city. The agent went over all the details, what they found in their research and then they asked for a sworn statement. It turns out my aunt didn't declare something like $1.2 million in additional income over five years, and as such she owed the IRS around $420,000 plus penalties. There was no way she was going to pay that on a teacher's pension. Her house was sold, her vehicles sold, and they left the state. Now, my aunt and uncle live in a depressing desert town like this in the southwest. The IRS paid me around $60,000 about three months after the appointment. She should have paid that $10,000. My pretentious stepmother made a waitress cry, so I ruined her relationship with my dad. Dad came into town to visit my brother and me for a few days and brought my French stepmother, Gabrielle, with him. Gabrielle is notoriously picky slash critical when it comes to food. You know the stereotypical snooty and rude French character in movies slash books who always complains that is not how this is done in France? She's this way when it comes to food. Going out to eat with her is embarrassing. She constantly sends back food, is insistent on food being made a certain way and always demands certain things done a certain way. One time, she asked the waiter to bring some mustard to the table, not two minutes later, she called him back because the mustard is old, bring us a new unopened bottle. More than once, I've had to apologize to the wait staff on my family's behalf and told the manager that I will vouch for them should Gabrielle leave a bad review on their site. She's made waiters and managers cry, she's that bad. Honestly, I have no idea why dad puts up with her when she does that, even though I know he's just as embarrassed as Mark and I are. When they got here yesterday, for some reason, they insisted they wanted to go out to dinner. Dad recommended our new favorite diner, which is known for its breakfasts at any time of the day. It's a greasy spoon in every sense of the word. Right out of the 1950s, every leather booth filled with truckers or locals, waitresses who automatically know their regulars' orders by heart and don't put up with crap from anyone, a bustling kitchen and while spotless, is just worn enough to let you know many people have been there. It may not look like a five-star restaurant, it has some of the best breakfasts you're ever going to eat. 
I was hesitant to take Gabrielle there if only because I didn't want to ruin the staff's day. Mark and I have been there enough times that the waitstaff slash cooks know us. However, Dad wanted Gabrielle to experience a true American classic and was offering to pay. Luckily, we got there during a not really busy time, so I told Dad to find a parking spot and I would go in to get us a table. The reason I did this was so I could warn the staff about Gabrielle and apologize in advance for anything she did. Fortunately, our usual waitress, Mary, thanked me for the warning and warned the rest of the staff. We go in, get our booth, and Gabrielle tries pulling her usual stunts. I won't go into everything she did because we'll be here forever but I'll leave a highlight reel. Gabrielle sent Mary back three times with the coffee because, in order it was too cold, it was too hot and not enough cream. Finally Mary just slapped the coffee pot on the table along with the cream slash sugar and told Gabrielle to make do because she wasn't going back to get her damn coffee. This made Mark and me chuckle and Gabrielle steam. While waiting, Gabrielle decided to accost a waitress who had just started working there and tell her to get some fresh biscuits. Poor Stephanie does as told and then Gabrielle makes a fuss about the packets of butter not being soft enough, despite Stephanie explaining that all the butter was kept cold for safety reasons. Gabrielle made a snide remark about how Stephanie couldn't wait five extra minutes to let the butter soften, which made Stephanie tear up and me about ready to tell Gabrielle to go F a French chef if food was that important to her. When our meals did arrive, Gabrielle was quiet during the meal, not making comments. I was unsure what was going to happen as a result. Either she really liked it or she was planning some nasty barb. When Mary dropped off the bill, Gabrielle took it before Dad could and said she was paying. Because I was sitting next to her, Gabrielle left a big fat zero in the tip line and left a note about it's cute that American chefs think they're good cooks when they've never stepped in a real kitchen before. Prove me wrong before. Closing the little book the receipt came in and hiding it so nobody else could see what she wrote. I was pissed when I read that note and was about ready to slap Gabrielle. I know the chefs slash servers who work at this particular diner learned their skills on the job and, if you ask me, they have every right to be as proud of their work as someone who went to culinary school would be. I took out $100 using the ATM at the diner and gave it to the staff as a tip along with an apology for her behavior, embarrassed and angry. Fortunately, they didn't hold it against us and told me that Mark and I were always welcome back. I also decided I was going to get back at Gabrielle. There was a benefit to this lockdown. During this time, bored out of our wits and wanting to better our skills, Mark and I have been binge-watching cooking videos online and practicing. I'd say we've become quite good. We know how to smoke our own bacon, cure corned beef, make creamy scrambled eggs and bake flaky croissants. When we got home, I told Mark my plan and he was grinning ear to ear. The next day, while Gabrielle and Dad still slept, Mark and I got up early and got right to work. We prepared scrambled eggs, home-cured slash smoked bacon, biscuits and a fruit salad. Dad woke up early and smelled the breakfast, waking up Gabrielle by saying that the kids were making breakfast. Dad came downstairs first and Mark asked him to set the table. Gabrielle came down as we were finishing up and she sat down, not offering to help. While Gabrielle commented about how it smells just like a restaurant she went to in France and couldn't wait to taste everything, Mark and I served Dad in our plates before putting everything back. Gabrielle looked at us, confused. I looked at her, oh, I thought you were going to a French cafe for breakfast I said. You did write on the receipt at the diner that you thought it was cute Americans think they're good cooks if they haven't set foot in a real kitchen and you wanted someone to prove you wrong. Dad looked at Gabrielle, his eyes wide as all the color drained from Gabrielle's face. You wrote what? Well, hop to it, I said sitting down. Enjoy your French breakfast with your French chefs. Gabrielle's face reddened before she left. I don't know if she was embarrassed or angry, but we were able to have a nice breakfast without any of Gabrielle's complaining. She did come back after getting breakfast and has been nice and quiet all day. Later that evening, her and dad had a big fight. I have a feeling that relationship is going to end very soon. My hag of a stepmom gave away my PlayStation 4 while I was away in college after my dad died. So I made her homeless while she was on her honeymoon with her newest husband. I'm an only son. My mom died of ovarian cancer at only 55 five years ago. It broke my dad's heart. They had been together since college and were the same age, with my dad being a month older. My dad met my now stepmom when she was my mom's nurse at the hospital where she spent her final days. My stepmom Grace played all the right notes to gain my dad's trust. She was empathetic to him, nurturing, comforting after my mom passed. I was 17 and old enough to sense that she was just trying to weasel her way into getting my dad's resources, but it was up to my dad if he wanted to be in a relationship with her. I was in my final year of public school and had just won a scholarship to attend college out of the country the following year. My dad mourned my mom for a year and that whole time Grace would check in on him by phone every month or so, in my opinion to scope out the possibility of sinking her hooks in him. After a year passed Grace took the gloves off and went hard after my dad. Grace was only 40 when she and my dad started seeing each other. I didn't like her but at the same time my dad at least didn't seem so depressed anymore, so I tried to be less pessimistic about her and give her the benefit of the doubt. In my gut I didn't trust her, though. My father was a very successful banker during his career, and amassed quite a portfolio of wealth. After six months of dating, Grace and my father are married. My dad never really got over my mom though, and he was getting weaker and weaker even though he was only 57. 
Since his health was fading he called me to him and asked me point blank, boy, what do you need to set you up in this life? I told him I don't need anything, I'm a man and can take care of myself, but what are you even talking about dad, you're going to be around for decades. Yet. I did remind him that he had living sisters with children, my aunts and cousins. I also reminded him that I had a full scholarship to college so don't worry about giving me any cash. He died only a year later at 59. I of course have seen lots of Hollywood movies so I consider the conspiracy theory that maybe my dad's nurse wife poisoned him and made him sign over all his money to her, but I really honestly do not think that's what happened. Other relatives didn't like Grace either, but they knew my dad was totally in love with my mom and that her death utterly broke him. Well long story short, my dad bequeathed his five-bedroom house to me even though I wasn't expecting it and didn't ask for it. He gave a small endowment to each of his sisters and their children. He left about 80% of all his existing money to Grace, which amounted to several hundreds of thousands of dollars. My dad ignored me because he's generous to a fault and still gave me several tens of thousands of dollars, which were of course very useful to me. Grace tried to put on a friendly front but I could tell she was angry as hell that she didn't get my dad's house, too. That belonged to me, and I had the legal papers to prove it. She was especially mad because we live in an extremely upscale and trendy location, and houses are hard to come by and easily sold for massive profit. During the first few months after my dad's death, I had the nauseating, creepy experience of knowing that Grace was trying to feel me out to see if I might be into a little relationship with her. Um, gross. She still stayed at the house though because over the last three years she had gotten used to living there and acting like she owned it. And, even though I officially owned it, I was always away at college and only visited my dad's old house once every couple of months, and even then it wasn't to see Grace, but to see my cousins who lived just a few miles away. I downplayed the fact that it was really my house, and, over the months I think Grace gradually forgot that she really had no legal right to the house. She probably believed that sooner or later, because I never asked her for any of the hundreds of thousands of my dad's dollars that she now had, that I was somehow independently wealthy and would just give up my house to her. I knew I'd eventually hydrogen bomb this beach when she started dating some new guy only five months after my dad was in the ground, and one time when I came home from college after graduating she and her new boyfriend, some sleazy looking d-bag named Ivan who was only a few years older than me, were acting like I was a guest in my own house and that they owned it. I played along. Grace told me she gave away my PlayStation 4 to Ivan's cousin because I'm too old to play with video games. I don't even know this mother effer and you give him my PS4 to give away to some other poop who I also don't know? I quickly changed all my network passwords that same day. I smiled but I knew what I had to do eventually. She also said that she and Ivan were getting married because I just can't mourn your father forever. I have to move on with life. I tell her that I graduated college and already secured employment with a local firm, and will soon find a new place to live. She looks thrilled. Especially the part where it looks like I'll soon have a new place to live. Then in a patronizing way she tells me, you always have a place in our house though, you are welcome to stay whenever you please. Thanks, Grace, really generous of you. What I really say is that I will probably have a new place in three months. She says that is wonderful because she intends to go to her homeland to have a wedding with Ivan and afterward have her honeymoon. She assures me it's a local affair otherwise I'd invite you, honey. And anyway I know you're so busy. I congratulate her. She asks me if I can watch the house for her. Watch my own house? Sure. What I really say is of. Course I will take care of the house. I am careful to not say your house. She and her d-bag fiancé, who I am 100% sure is only there for Grace's money, go on their trip and I immediately put out advertisements and rental websites offering to lease my house. I hire movers and have all of Grace's furniture and possessions boxed up and put into a storage rental facility. I retain all of my parents' furniture that they had before my dad met Grace. Locks? Changed. All of them. Within days, I am inundated with dozens of inquiries regarding my amazing, furnished house with fantastic views. I rent it to a wonderful young family. A barrister and a school teacher wife and their two preteen children. They pay me their first and last month's rent, and sign a lease for a year. I warn them about my crazy stepmom who thinks this is her house, but I present them with contact information to my lawyer, the same lawyer my dad retained, in case they need any assurance that I'm on the level. I also gave my lawyer the information about the storage facility, including the fact that I generously paid four months of storage in advance, which is a whole month longer than Grace's Czech honeymoon adventure. I then found a great apartment in the city near my new place of work. There I met a woman in a restaurant I frequent at night after a long workday. We have been dating six months now and are engaged to be married. Grace of course tried to shriek and cause trouble when she realized she got kicked out of my house but my lawyer quickly shut her mouth without me having to ever speak to her garbage face again. From what I hear, she and her trash husband left the country and I assume they're blowing through my dad's money and will soon be broke like these sorts of people usually become when they taste a little bit of what they think is the good life. So maybe Grace will go and try to exploit some other lonely man into giving her his money. Speaking of money, the house that I rent out is generating so much money that I not only am able to help pay for my cousin's college, but I moved into a larger apartment of my own together with my fiancé. I love my job but really, I could survive solely on renting my dad's old house. And to think. If Grace had only been cooler and nicer I might have let her stay at the house, just to be a good sport. And definitely if she stayed the hell out of my room. But no, she had to act all proprietary, so I had to make her homeless as a wedding gift. I bought another PS4, even though I didn't even use my old one that much. It didn't matter. It wasn't for Grace to give away. You don't give away other people's things. Which is why I chose to kick Grace out of my house. Because it's mine, and I decide who stays there. My wife cheated on me with my best friend, 
so I wrecked their careers and publicly humiliated both of them. SH Ted and Sarah have been like family to my wife and I for several years, practically ever since we moved in across the street from them. The four of us were extremely tight. Our kids are the same age as theirs and are all good friends. We were one big family unit. We did dinner together a few times a week. We went on vacations together. I truly saw SH Ted as a brother, and my wife and Sarah were very close too. Five months ago, I was completely blindsided by the discovery of an affair between my wife and SH Ted. My wife had left her email open on our computer, and I saw an email from her to her longtime therapist saying that SH Ted would be joining her at an upcoming session again. Uh, what the F? My mind started racing, why in the world would SH Ted be going to her therapy sessions without my knowledge? I did a search and found some other emails to and from the therapist proving that SH Ted had been going to sessions together with her for about six weeks. I checked our mobile phone account and discovered that, since late summer, they had been exchanging hundreds of texts every day, peaking at nearly 500 per day by the holidays. Speaking of the holidays, my wife and I hosted both of our families, parents, siblings, etc., for both Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner, and SH Ted and Sarah joined us either for dinner or after dinner on both holidays. Text records show that the entire time that they were at our house celebrating with our families, my wife and SH Ted were texting each other across the room. They were doing that pretty much every time the four of us hung out, for months. And, you know, all day every day just in general but what bothers me the most is that they were doing it with Sarah and I right there. I confronted my wife with the evidence and she admitted that yes, she and SH Ted had fallen in love. It just happened. I don't. Know how. But I love him and I just don't feel anything for you anymore, I'm sorry. They had gone on a school district trip together, something had happened in her hotel room, and things had moved quickly from there. She explained, as I lay face down on the couch, unable to look at her, that they had already made plans to move out and divorce me and Sarah, and while they didn't plan to move in together immediately because of the kids, they'd probably do so eventually. The meetings with the therapist were supposedly mostly for the purpose of finding a way to break this to me and Sarah as gently as possible, because they were so very concerned for our well-being. Sarah and I are fairly certain that they weren't planning on telling us about the affair at all, and were simply going to discover their feelings for one another several months down the line, after they'd come up with some other reason to divorce the two of us, my wife moved out two months ago. I was, and still am, utterly destroyed. I cry every day. I cried writing the first few paragraphs of this story just now. I worry non-stop about the impact on our kids but I am also not exactly a shrinking violet when I feel that I've been wronged. And in this case I was, objectively, very very wronged. So, a couple of years ago, SH Ted ran for a board of education seat as a pretty extreme underdog. I helped him with his campaign materials and debate prep, and my wife, a well-known school district employee, this becomes important later, got the word out as best she could. Much to our surprise, he actually won in a squeaker, by just a few dozen votes. Being on the board became the center of SH Ted's world. He joined every committee that he could. This turned into the foundation of his affair with my wife, as they were constantly going to school events and meetings together on evenings and weekends. Once I discovered the affair, my thoughts turned pretty quickly to revenge, and it occurred to me that an extramarital affair between a member of the Board of Education and an employee of the school district was at least bad politics and possibly violated district policy. Making things far worse for them was that my wife was in the running for an open administrative position, and everyone knew that she was more or less guaranteed the job and the major pay raise that came with it. She had just finished her master's degree in school administration, at the urging of her principal and the superintendent, so that she could be promoted to this specific position. I had plenty of evidence of the affair, texts from both of them admitting to it, text records showing that they were texting hundreds of times a day, emails to and from the therapist, etc. I considered simply emailing all of the evidence to the board and the superintendent, but felt like I, as the grieving, betrayed spouse, might not be seen as a credible source. So instead, I invented a fictitious furious friend who was planning on showing up to the next board meeting and publicly shaming the two of them for their affair. I told my wife that I'd tried to talk this person down but couldn't guarantee that they wouldn't show up and humiliate them publicly. As I expected, this led SH Ted to conclude that the only option was for him to preemptively admit the affair to the board. The superintendent subsequently recommended that SH Ted resign, which he did. Sarah said that he was utterly humiliated and crushed, and barely got out of bed for a few days afterward. Once word of the affair and SH Ted's resignation started getting around, the superintendent, a longtime friend of both my wife and SH Ted, contacted my wife and tearfully informed her that it was no longer politically appropriate for her to be promoted to an administrative position within the district. The position that had been lined up for her was later filled by an outside candidate. This sent waves of confusion and rumor throughout the district, as it was pretty well known that my wife was getting the job. The day after she was informed that she wasn't getting the promotion, my wife and I, despite our crumbling marriage, took our son out to breakfast together on his birthday, and a parent stopped by our table to congratulate her on her new role. She said, thanks, then excused herself to go cry in the bathroom for a while. I let the dust settle for a couple of weeks, and then, right before my wife moved out, let them in on my little secret, there was never a furious friend threatening to expose them in the first place. Just me. Word of all of this has gotten around our fairly small town, which SH Ted grew up in and my wife has worked in for nearly 20 years. My wife refuses to talk to me about how things are at work now, but I've heard from some people I know in the district that her formerly spotless reputation has taken a major hit. SH Ted, formerly a gregarious social presence in our neighborhood and at events and pubs in town, has completely gone underground and barely emerges to mow his lawn. He's moving out soon, 
to a shitty little townhouse which is all he can afford due to all the child support he's going to have to pay his wife. My wife and SH Ted claim that they plan on trying to make things work together, despite all the public humiliation. I wish them lots of luck with that. I'm sure it will be a lot of fun to show their faces together in town. Women, what's the worst that a man ever treated you? I married my high school sweetheart. When we were together at first, age 17, he was so wonderful. Funny, smart, sweet. For my first Christmas present, he got me a new stereo system for my shitty 98 Pontiac Sunfire. We lost our virginities to each other. We were a year apart in high school, so I did community college to stick near him until he graduated. I went to the college he chose. Once we got there, he was the only one of his friend group, who also went to the same college from high school, who had a girlfriend. I immediately got left by the wayside. I had no friends, so I tried to make some. I realized, but not enough, that my whole identity was wrapped up in my boyfriend. By the way, the gifts stopped being thoughtful. Then they became non-existent. He went out with his friend group and left me alone. When I cried to him in my dorm about how I felt alone, and maybe we should break up, he started crying too and said that wasn't what he wanted. While I was on my knees with tears on my face crying about how alone I felt, he asked me if I'd give him a blowjob. I did. I was young and stupid and we didn't break up. Fast forward through college. I started to notice that at every party we went to, he was always more animated and having more fun with anyone as long as I wasn't there. Once, he gave a girl a piggyback ride right in front of me because she asked him to. When I spoke up about how I felt sidelined and neglected, I was told I was crazy. This would become the battle cry every time we fought. I didn't know what gaslighting was then, but I do now. One of the clearest memories I have of him was just before I graduated college. He asked if I had studied Flash, and I said no because it was on its way out and no one was using it anymore. I remember it was the day of the Super Bowl and our roommates were out. We had been watching the Puppy Bowl just before this conversation. We got into an argument, he tried to. Tell me I was wrong and I just said I knew more about the subject than he did. He wrapped his hands around my throat and pushed me back on the bed. He choked me. When I started gasping and crying, he let me go. And he had the nerve to say, God damn it, why did you make me do that? I should have left right then. After college. He didn't have a job, so he decided to go to graduate school. He said I'd need to support him otherwise he'd have to pull from his inheritance. I had a full-time job in a recession in my field, which was rare. So I supported him that way and when funds ran low. I took out payday loans. At his insistence. I got him a job at my agency. He got laid off a month before our wedding. I worked through that, we got married, then I found another place to work since I was mad the agency had laid him off. Meanwhile, still no job for him. I once asked if he'd just get a job at Walmart or Target or something, just to take some pressure off me, and he said I guess I'll just have to deal with the depression when people I know see me working there. I didn't make him get a job. Eventually, I had enough and said let's move from our college town back to the big city where we were both from. Our friends and family were there, he would have more opportunities. I wasn't worried about myself, I had a good resume. He balked. I said you know what, I pay the rent here, I'm not renewing our lease. I'm moving back to the city and you can come with me if you want. He started applying to jobs. Right away, he got one, making twice what he made before. Everything was great. Right? Wrong. I negotiated my contract to work from home, then when that didn't work switched over to another job. Still working from home once we'd moved, making decent money. But as soon as he had his real job he changed. Started spending exorbitant amounts on new glasses, clothes, shoes. Started working out. You know where this is going. There was one more incident of violence. We were arguing about something I can't recall. I said I was just going to go to sleep and turned my back on him, ready to get into bed. He shoved me, hard, from behind. I landed on my hands and knees and started crying. He said, verbatim, you're fine. Stop crying like someone's going to feel sorry for you. Long story short, too late, he ended up cheating on me with a coworker. His assistant, as if that couldn't get more cliche. We even went to her wedding, for God's sake. He tried to tell me there was no one else, we'd just grown apart. Now, the thing is, that's true. That's part of the warning. You change so much between ages 17 and 30. Some people can make it work, but some can't. His motivations weren't based on our changes, however. He already had a new model lined up, five years younger than me. No matter. I honestly don't miss him, and I'm glad he's gone, even though it hurts so much at the start. But aside from the emotional scars, he left me with so much more. If I hadn't been with him for so long, I would have moved to Florida. It was always my dream, not so much these days, I wouldn't have destroyed my credit with those stupid payday loans, which I don't take out anymore, I wouldn't have wasted my prime years where he told me he wanted to have babies with me, then only to back up right before the clock started ticking. Young women, please, value yourselves more than I did. Know and realize when things are bad. 
Get out when the getting's good, or hold on to the good man that you have. Do better than I did. My wife was sued and we lost a lot of money. I'm feeling resentment towards her and I don't know how to move past it. My wife was recently sued, she lost and we had to pay. The money is a significant amount for us, we didn't have much in savings or our emergency fund to begin with, and both of those accounts are now empty. My current problem is trying to move past the resentment and anger I'm feeling towards my wife. Until now I've always felt like we were a partnership in our marriage. But, since I'm the breadwinner I can't help but to feel like I'm spending my money on something that isn't my fault. I've had no problem paying the mortgage, and taking care of various financial burdens that come with being a married homeowner. However, I've been the only one to put money aside in our savings and other accounts to prepare for an emergency, like a totaled car, someone loses their job, medical bills, or an act of God. Not a stupid lawsuit where I know my wife is guilty. She has a part-time job and doesn't make much money, but pays for smaller things when she can, like groceries and some random bills, but she does take care of a lot of cooking, cleaning and caring for our pets. What did my wife do? She used LinkedIn to find her former ex-best friend, she ended up creating a realistic-looking fake LinkedIn profile with a vague occupation of recruiter. My wife ended up sending this ex-best friend, Laura a few messages pretending to be a recruiter in her line of work. Laura finally responded thinking that this recruiter was real, my wife wanted her phone number but Laura gave her a personal email address instead. My wife created a second fake LinkedIn profile and started to send messages to people with similar titles as Laura at her company. These messages said derogatory things about Laura, a mixture of truthful things but embarrassing and just fabricated bullshit to make Laura look bad. Her manager got one of these messages that claimed that Laura was a heavy drug user. Laura's manager talked to her about these messages and he felt like the messages were bizarre and seemed like someone was trying to troll or harass Laura. Well, Laura's team had her back and helped her save these messages. Not only that, but Laura requested that she be drug tested anyway, to provide further evidence that she was clean. My wife didn't know this at this point, but Laura was pregnant. Several of her co-workers, including her manager, testified on Laura's behalf. Using the personal email address she got from the fake recruiter profile, she was able to find a few social media platforms Laura was on and was able to figure out her husband's name. She did some more internet sleuthing and found Laura's husband on Facebook. Laura's husband didn't have much on his Facebook profile, but you could see his business email address on it. My wife sent him an email claiming that Laura was cheating on him. The husband confronted Laura about this email and Laura encouraged him to keep responding to this person, and save the messages, as well as to start asking specific questions about this supposed affair. My wife thought she was being clever and ended up telling the husband that Laura was cheating on him during the work week, she even gave him specific dates. What she didn't realize was Laura had something turned on in Google Maps where it keeps years worth of historical GPS data. Some of the dates my wife gave him also happened to be days where they both worked from home together. She also ended up giving him dates during a time they were on vacation together. Laura had her husband keep responding as much as possible to my wife and to back up all correspondence. My wife was able to find out when and where the baby shower was going to be. One of Laura's friends had created a public registry for her and had the invitation online. My wife decided to show up unannounced, the baby shower took place in a semi-public place, they had rented out an area connected. To the public business, she did not make herself known immediately. Instead she looked for patrons that were entering and exiting the rented out room. She was able to get the attention of a few guests that had never met her and tried to gossip about Laura, my wife was telling people that Laura didn't actually know who the father was, among other things. This was at an event where her husband was at as well. The word got back around to Laura and she spotted my wife and apparently immediately put together all the pieces of what happened. I'm leaving a fair amount of information out, my wife was able to find phone numbers, social media accounts and email for other people in Laura's circle and sent them messages about Laura on multiple occasions. All the messages were trying to paint Laura in an extremely derogatory light. All the events I've mentioned so far took place over a year or so. My wife didn't think to mask her IP address, so it was pretty easy to find out that all of these made-up messages came from the same IP address, ours. Many of Laura's friends and family testified on her behalf, Laura had everyone saved as much digital evidence as possible, and it was a lot. Laura and her husband hired a lawyer and decided to sue my wife. They had ample evidence against her. All the saved messages, close friends and even her manager spoke on her behalf, she showed that she went to see a therapist once all the harassment started because she was depressed and anxious, she showed that she and her husband went to counseling after the accusations of her cheating. She even went above and beyond and had more drug tests done to show she was clean and my wife's accusations were 100% false, and even had a paternity test done to show that my wife was again wrong and chose to lie. I honestly felt awful for Laura, there were lots of tears on her end. You could tell how much emotional stress she had gone through. She said that being pregnant during the majority of this was absolutely horrific and was worried the stress and anxiety would somehow hurt her baby. She was pained that her one and only baby shower was ruined by my wife and that was something that could never be truly repaid or made up for. And that my wife's harassment continued even after Laura gave birth and was trying to manage a newborn child. My wife has never done anything this crazy before. I knew she could be a little petty and jealous of others, especially people she used to be friends with in the past, but it was only talk, no action. We've had a very happy marriage otherwise, we rarely fight, have a lot in common, we have a lot of fun together. But, she really fucked up this time. I don't know how to move forward. I know someone is going to suggest therapy, but I really want to start building up an emergency fund again. We're pretty screwed financially for a while. My sister-in-law has been trying to take my life in multiple ways. Three days ago, 
My husband and I went to his parents' house to visit for the weekend. His sister is a college student and was home for the summer as well so we got to see her too. Since they have a lakefront property and the weather was very nice, a lot of our time was spent at the lake this weekend, and some very, weird things happened. For some background first, I've always gotten kind of an off vibe from my husband's younger sister. When we were dating, it seemed like she would find any excuse in the world to avoid me, and when we did interact, I sensed some hostile undertones pretty much every single time. I brushed it off as just me maybe not clicking with her or misinterpreting her. Still, when we got married last year, I included her as one of my bridesmaids. And low-key, she was a huge pain in the ass for that entire experience. My other bridesmaids told me she made snide comments to them that made them quite uncomfortable. Was huffy during the bridal shower and wedding rehearsal. Made weird faces at the decorations and pulled weird faces when she ate the cake too. I still brushed it off as maybe just her personality and left it at that. At the lake, though, a number of events occurred that kind of unsettled me. On the day we arrived, my husband's sister had invited a number of her own friends from college over and the group of us spent some time together in the water. At one point, we all decided to have a big chicken fight and at first it was quite fun and lighthearted. Then a bunch of people including my husband broke away to do their own thing and his sister turned to me and said let's do another round, with her other two friends left in the lake, and asked to get on my shoulders. I said sure, knelt down under the water to let her up, but instead of getting on my shoulders properly she got on top of my head and wouldn't budge at all when I tried to move her. I couldn't get her off me or even get my head up to breathe for what felt like a long while, my head was being squeezed between her thighs and I was seriously panicking by the time I managed to dislodge her and bring my head up to the surface. What's weird about it was that the other two weren't even paying attention to any of this or even participating in the attempted chicken fight at all. My husband's sister didn't say anything to me when I came up to the surface, just kind of gave me this weird snort chuckle and got out of the water. I was noticeably shaken and trying to catch my breath but I assumed maybe this was just some sort of an accident, so I tried to act fine and didn't say anything. My husband's parents have a sea that they let those of us with a boating license use. I don't have a boating license so it was mostly just me riding behind my husband with him at the wheel. My husband's sister offered me a ride, though, and I didn't want to say no, thinking maybe this was a chance to bond with her, so I agreed to it. I told her the sea still made me quite nervous, though, and to take it easy if she could. She definitely did not take it easy. She took any and every opportunity she could get to jump the sea off the wakes of boats that passed us by, was doing sharp turns at high speeds like crazy, and I found myself having to cling to her for dear life throughout the ride. There were points where we both nearly fell off the sea with how wildly she was driving it. Again, though, I didn't say anything about it and acted fine because I thought maybe she didn't realize how fast and crazy she was going. Later my husband's dad yelled at her for attempting to splash my husband with the sea while he was in the water. Their dad told her it was dangerous to try and ride close to people in the water like that because she could have run him over. After about an hour or so, it was just me in the water with my husband's sister on the sea and she drove that thing within a couple of feet of me just to turn it and splash me with the water. Way closer than she ever got to my husband when she'd do it to him. I laughed it off but again was inwardly freaked out. That brings us to yesterday at dinner. As everyone in the family has been made acutely aware of by my husband, I have a serious dairy allergy, to the point where ingesting even a little bit of it can risk causing anaphylaxis. My husband's sister contributed a big pot of tomato rice and told me there was no dairy in it so I could have some. I trusted her and helped myself to a portion of it, but shortly after eating it I had to excuse myself because I started to feel extremely ill and wound up spending the rest of my night puking my brains out. I felt super faint and it took a lot of effort to breathe, Thankfully I had my EpiPen if things got bad enough but still the whole experience was just awful. The explanation I got later was that my husband's sister finished the tomato rice with butter to make it creamier and then forgot she put it in there before serving it to me. Seems again like it could be an innocent mistake, but, given the combination of everything that happened this weekend, I'm starting to feel suspicious that it's more than just that at this point. I don't know if I'm overreacting or just being a paranoid mess, because this is a huge accusation, but I can't help but feel that niggling suspicion that maybe my husband's sister genuinely meant me harm. I feel like I'm fucking crazy. Update. Attempted to post this update to true off my chest but for some reason it keeps getting taken down, I'd quie. So for the time being, I'll post my update here for those curious. First off, I'd like to extend my most sincere gratitude to the Redditors who took the time out of their day to give me advice. I wasn't expecting so many people to come to my support and confirm I wasn't being crazy or overreacting. I definitely needed to hear it, and in retrospect, I think this whole situation was really the wake-up call I needed to be more assertive and confident in my assessment of situations. 
a book I noticed a lot of Redditors recommend to me was Gavin De Becker's The Gift of Fear, so I gave it a look and have now begun reading it, so far I've found it really insightful, thanks for the rec. Anyways, here's what's happened since my last post. So I did end up talking to my husband about his sister's behaviors toward me last weekend. I was planning on sitting him down and just point blank raising my concerns about her, but her name came up organically in conversation so I ended up using it as a springboard for telling him about last weekend's incidents. As I went through each sketchy incident I had with her, my husband believed me and was angry on my behalf about what happened. He also supports my wishes to keep more of a distance from her going forward. He told me to let him know if she ever pulls anything like the incidents in the water slash sea again, the dairy thing he still believes to be a genuine accident, apparently she was in tears over how badly she felt about that. Apparently my sister-in-law's behaviors last weekend weren't 100% out of character for her. After telling my husband about my incidents with her, he explained to me that she's had a history of crossing lines and testing the limits of people's boundaries like this, albeit never this egregiously. Until college, she struggled making and keeping friends due to constantly crossing peers' boundaries, my husband even had to come to her aid in grade school due to her pissing off the wrong people who were ready to beat her ass. He thought she'd gotten much better in recent years, which is why he was so taken aback when I told him about the stuff she did last weekend. Apparently she's been in therapy for a very long time now to treat some mental health and behavioral issues. My husband was slash is pissed at her for what she did to me, but he genuinely doesn't think her intentions were to kill or maim me, just to test my limits and haze me, albeit extremely recklessly. I'm inclined to agree with him, but my guard is still up in case it's anything more than that. His theory is that because I'm quite shy, she figured I was less likely to put my foot down with her, and that's why she did stuff to fuck with me in particular. It's not anything I did or said, tilde dot 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 yes, I did ask tilde. So going forward, I'm going to try to keep brief any interaction I have with her at future family events and stuff. I'll still be polite of course, but no way am I going to be alone with her anymore, and my husband says he's on board with this arrangement and will intervene if necessary to make sure it stays. It sucks to realize I'm probably never going to have a good relationship with my sister-in-law like I'd hoped, I've never had siblings before, so I was excited by the idea of having someone accept me as a sister and having that sort of a relationship. Ah well. I get along well with the rest of his family, and I have enough kick-ass friends in my life who are like sisters to me in their own way, ha. My wife and her best friend accused me of having an affair, then got angry when I didn't have one. I, 31M, and my wife, 29F, had a baby last December. It was a traumatic birth and my wife developed postpartum depression. While she was originally going to go back to work after the birth, she's been struggling enough that we decided to wait until our daughter was a year old and reassess. She has been going to therapy weekly. With my wife home full time, I've had to work increased hours. This is something we discussed prior to making this decision and she knew this from the start. A few weeks ago, my boss approached me about a project that would require a lot of overtime in a short amount of time. It would both be great financially and for my career. I talked to my wife about it and she agreed that I should say yes to my boss. For the four weeks I'd be working on this, my mill and her best friend, Jesse, 29F, name changed, would come help out with some of the duties that I typically do. Jesse is a SOM with a four-year-old and a two-year-old. She began coming over during the day and would watch the kids with my wife. Three weeks into the project, it became clear that we'd need a few more weeks to get it together. I went home that night and talked to my wife about it. She said she was okay with it, but got very cold in the days after. It was an unusual behavior over the past few months, so I didn't think much about it and tried not to take it personally. During the last week of the project, I got home one night and saw that Jesse was still at the house. I didn't think much about it, said hi to her and my wife, and then went to go check on our daughter. Before I could get to her room, I heard Jesse say something along the lines of, he doesn't even stop to greet you. Definitely a sign. I turned around and asked what it was a sign of. Immediately, my wife started crying and Jesse started accusing me of having an affair. She told me that I must hate my wife because she has PPD and am not attracted to her because she gained weight from the pregnancy. Neither of these things are true. I'm trying my best to help my wife through her PPD while supporting our family. And I think she looks great how she is right now, she just hasn't wanted to have sex and I haven't pushed. Jesse then demanded to see my phone. I told her no. She told me that's a sign that I'm guilty. I told my wife that I would let her see my phone if she wanted to. She nodded and something inside me broke. I guess it was the thought that she actually believed I was having an affair really got to me. And that she didn't trust me after everything we've been through. Well, she looked through the phone and there was no evidence. Jesse started saying that I deleted the evidence. She started screaming and woke up our daughter, 
so I told her to get out of the house. Eventually, she left and I went to calm our daughter since my wife was still on the couch crying. When my daughter was asleep again, I sat down by my wife and tried to talk to her about what's been happening. She told me that she's been worried ever since I started working all the overtime. I told her that we'd talked about how good of an opportunity it was and she agreed to letting me take on this project. She said it was very suspicious to increase the length of the project. I told her that sometimes that happens. She wanted more evidence, so I showed her messages and emails with timestamps from work and pay stubs showing the OT. She said she believed me and was sorry for doubting me, it was just that Jesse had been telling her that these were all signs that I was cheating. I asked her why she believed Jesse more than me, and why she didn't come to me with her concerns. She didn't have a real answer. It's been a couple weeks and the project is over. I actually scaled back and I'm trying to work a little less than I was before the project so I can spend more time with my wife and daughter. But I feel so burnt out trying to do everything and becoming resentful because in the back of my mind, I know that my wife doesn't trust me. I ask myself, what happens the next time I have a project? Or I have to run errands one day? Or if I have a business trip? Am I going to come back every time to accusations that I'm cheating? I've tried bringing it up a couple times but my wife tells me it's not the time and that she's tired or sad. I try to be mindful of her feelings but I wonder if that means that I can never have any of my own. I'm not sure what to do here. Any advice for how I can move forward? Update 1. Thank you to everyone for all of the advice and support on my previous post. I think a lot of you pointed out what should have been obvious, that I need to get a therapist and start looking after my own mental health. A couple people asked for an update, so I'm giving one, but it's not happy. That night I approached my wife and told her that I was going to find a therapist. I didn't connect it to her accusations or anything, just said that I was having a tough time and needed therapy. She shrugged and told me to do whatever. Next day, I got home from work and our room and my home office were ripped apart. Things everywhere. Important papers scattered. I don't see her but our daughter's in her room crying. My wife left her alone, her cell phone's off. I call my in-laws and a few friends, but no one's seen her. I'm starting to get worried and I call my mom to see if she can babysit while I go out and look for her. Before my mom can get home, my wife gets back, Jessie's driving. Jessie doesn't come in, she hasn't been back in the house since I kicked her out because she was offended by my behavior, but my wife does. She's clearly upset, been crying. I ask what happened. I thought at first the house might have been robbed. She starts screaming at me that I'm being unfaithful and that the therapy is a front so I can meet my mistress. I try to calm her down and tell her that's not true, but she came at me and she hit me. My nose is broken. She kind of realized what she did and sat down on the couch and went comatose, just stared at the wall. I went into my daughter's room and locked the door. Called my mom to tell her what happened, she was already on her way, and my mill to ask her to come over and take care of my wife. I packed a bag for my daughter and when my mom got there, we left. My wife didn't even look up. We dropped my daughter off with my dad and then went to urgent care for my nose. I got blood all over my mom's new Subaru. My daughter and I are staying with my parents for a while and my wife's staying with hers. I am looking into getting a restraining order against Jesse. My wife and I are separating. I love her but I won't live with someone who hurts me and who could potentially hurt our daughter. I am not going forward with a divorce yet, with the hopes that my wife will get the treatment she needs and we can work things out. My in-laws told me that they're looking at inpatient treatment at a local hospital. But I also have everything well documented in case of an eventual custody battle. My heart's broken because I know this isn't my wife, this is a sickness in her mind. But I need to keep myself and our daughter safe and give her the space to recover. I'm hoping that this is the right decision. Thanks again everyone. Edit, thank you all for your feedback. I've talked to my parents after reading your comments and came to the conclusion that for my daughter's protection, I need to file a police report. I am headed to the station now. Update 2. My wife passed on early Monday morning. Convinced by her friend Jesse that I was having an affair that I did not have, she had a mental break, which resulted in my taking our infant daughter and staying with my parents for a while. She was with her parents, who planned on taking her to the hospital for inpatient treatment on Monday. On Sunday night she came to my parents' house and demanded I give her our daughter. Because she had left her alone for several hours the last time she was responsible for her and had gotten physical with me, I refused. I offered to let her come in and spend time with her while my parents and I were present, but she didn't want to come in and wanted to take our daughter with her. She was upset but left eventually. A few hours later, she drove her parents' car into a tree and died. The friend, Jessie, came to see my daughter and me yesterday. After some tears, she told me that she was planning to speak at my wife's funeral. 
She had already cleared it with my in-laws but was letting me know as a courtesy. I told her she would not be speaking at the funeral. We fought and she left after telling me that I was an asshole and not the only person who loved my wife. I talked to my in-laws who were adamant that Jesse be allowed to speak. She and my wife knew each other since they were kids and my in-laws are close to her. We're all very fragile right now and I fear that pushing this further would hurt my relationship with my in-laws, which I don't want. Still, the thought of seeing Jesse up there at my wife's funeral makes me feel sick. I don't think I can stand to listen to her, knowing that she took joy in my wife's deteriorating mental health and picked up my wife, leaving my daughter home alone. That being said, I don't trust myself to make the best decisions right now. My mind's clouded by grief, guilt, and fear. My parents are split on what to do and I don't have the energy to reach out to my friends. So I'm coming here again to ask for your advice. Thank you. What's the dumbest thing you've ever done while high? Getting high as f before dinner with my wife's parents. Recently, I traveled to Denver, Colorado with my wife and my wife's parents. As a resident of a non-legalized state, and as someone who is too much of a wimp to regularly buy illegal drugs, the thing I was looking forward to most was the chance to buy fancy legal weed. So the first thing I do upon arriving is drag my wife to a nearby dispensary for a shopping spree. And oh my god, it was just like in my dreams. Tons of different options and neat little sample jars and a team of helpful stoners walking me through the various strains, are you looking for a mellow body high? Or do you want something that gives you a bit more pep and energy? Or are you just hoping for something light to take the stress off? Yes, yes and yes. I reply eagerly, like a fat kid in a candy store, and request an eighth ounce of about seven different options. In hindsight, if I learned anything from this experience, it is that my math and science teachers never taught me basic information, like what is an ounce? Or how much weed can a person consume in a single weekend? And it was at this dispensary that I also learned that you can't actually smoke in public places. As a result, before leaving, I begged my wife to buy some edibles that I could munch on until we found a place to properly get lit. After expressing shock as to the absurd volume of drugs that we were buying she relents, and we walk out of the store with what felt like a dump truck of weed plus a small package of seemingly innocuous ginger snap cookies. When we finally get back to the hotel room, I tear those bad boys open. Only to find about a dozen tiny cookies roughly the size of a quarter. What the fuck, Denver? Seeing the skepticism in my eyes, my wife warns me that I should go easy and look at the back of the package first before trying one. Dose size, half cookie, I read silently as I start taking. Micro bites from the edges, like a giant chinchilla gnawing on a sunflower seed. But what kind of a savage only eats half a cookie? So a second later, I covertly pop the remainder into my mouth. And then I quickly stuff another two cookies in my mouth for good measure the moment my wife turns her back. We may not have legal weed back home, but I routinely devour an entire package of Milano's in one sitting without breaking a sweat. About 30 minutes later we are in the backseat of her parents' rental car on the way to dinner. And that's when things start to go tits up. My stomach growls. Loudly and angrily. My wife looks at me with inquisitive eyes that seem to say diarrhea. But I merely clutch my tummy and mumble something about altitude sickness. You didn't eat a whole cookie, did you? She asks, 10% in genuine concern and 90% in seething irritation. Of course not. I respond, avoiding eye contact for the remainder of the car ride. A few minutes later we are climbing out of her parents' rental car and heading into some trendy farm-to-table restaurant. I don't remember how I made it to my seat, and I don't remember even looking at the menu, but I do remember the concerned look on the waiter's face as he asked me if I was doing alright. Keep it together, man, I say to myself. But my wife's sudden groan suggests that I may have also said that to the waiter. Things are going downhill fast. The waiter nods sympathetically, takes our orders, and then heads to the next table. The moment he walks away, my wife is staring daggers at me. I start to worry that the jig is up. You are sweating. From your entire face, she says with both pity and disgust. Not quite knowing what to do, I reach for my napkin and proceed to blot my cheeks, nose, neck, chin and forehead. At this point, my wife's mom looks over at me with some concern. Are you alright? She asks kindly. Yeah, the food's just a bit spicy, I reply, far too quick to realize that we had literally just ordered and that there is nothing on the table except for a basket of dinner rolls. My wife kicks me under the table to grab my attention. Bathroom. Now. She hisses. Get it together. I reluctantly get up from the table and head for the toilet. After splashing several handfuls of water on my face, I approach a urinal and start to pee. Now, one of the more disconcerting effects of those tiny ginger snap monsters is the feeling that time has become untethered from reality. As I am peeing, I start to get the very unsettling feeling that I have been taking a piss for the better part of an hour and that my wife must be pacing around the restaurant worried about me. After finally finishing, I again splash some water on my face and return to my seat, making sure to apologize to the table for being gone such a long time just in case my math was off. Next, I try briefly to engage in small talk with my wife's father, but I am far too high to understand what either of us are saying. Not wanting to start laughing uncontrollably at the wrong moment, or, really, at any moment, I figure the safest idea is to nod my head periodically and drink a ton of water. Nothing cures mental fatigue like water, right? To my wife's horror, I stand up, grab my water glass and thrust it out to the waiter, who unfortunately is on the opposite side of the restaurant. But he turns out to be really cool and, after making his way over to our table, tells me that he'll do his best to keep me stocked with ice water for the rest of the meal. 
He also helpfully suggests that if the dinner rolls aren't too spicy for me, I should probably eat one or two so that I'm not sitting there on an empty stomach. Smart man. However, after going through all of the bread on the table and three glasses of water, I start to get worried that I need actual food to offset the growing paranoia from those tiny ginger snap devils. Do you think I should flag down the waiter again and ask what's taking so long? I suggest helpfully to my wife. What? We literally just ordered three effing minutes. Ago. And at that exchange, my wife loses her cool. How many cookies did you eat? She demands. Whoa, easy there, Torquemada, I respond, somewhat horrified at her outburst. I had a few cookies, but keep it down. I don't want your parents to know how effed up I am right now. Really? They are sitting two feet away from you. They know. I look up and for the first time notice both of my in-laws just staring at me. For what literally felt like an eternity. I, 69M, told my son, 48M, that I don't want to be part of his life anymore because he is gay. I take it back and I miss him. I feel that I should preface by saying I'm not the typical type to ask the internet for advice on such a personal issue or any issue. But the unfortunate thing I've come to realize is that I can't discuss this with anyone I know. I'm in my late 60s and my son is in his late 40s, for relevant my context. His mother and I divorced when he was young and for all intents and purposes I essentially raised him as a single father from a certain point onward. I did my best to raise him well and to be sure he had everything he needed, but I worked a lot of hours and was very career focused. I realize now I was somewhat absent. I'm also fairly emotionally reserved in general, at least when it comes to physically speaking, I'm better at writing. When he was in high school and in college he had several girlfriends, and one girl I thought he was very serious about for the majority of his time during his undergraduate education. They broke up. After that he never brought home any more girls or talked about any, and he moved away to attend medical school and we stopped talking as much as we had previously. I remember very distinctly one time while he was visiting on a break from school I was worried about him and I had asked if he was on drugs. He just looked physically ill and in a poor state. He assured me it was stress from school and he would be fine. But I remember this clearly because this visit home was when I first started to think he could be gay. Now the thing is my son has never told me that he is gay even to this day, but it has become an unspoken acknowledgement between us. He has a roommate, that's how we mutually refer to him, and he's had the same friend for a long time. Sometimes I will ask about him but the answers are always short, basically that he's doing well. I think I know maybe 5 things about his friend after some almost 20 years, maybe longer. We speak on the phone occasionally as we live far away and this is something we never discuss much if at all. Recently I've been doing a lot of thinking. I think I'm a poor father. Somewhere down the line I taught my son that we can't speak about who he is. I'll admit I'm not the most versed in this kind of lifestyle thing, but I don't want to be shut out from his life. I want to tell him that whatever this is he's perfectly fine in my book and I love him. I want to know him and his friend, but I don't know how to tell him or what to say. I'm not sure if I should say boyfriend as again, he's never said anything to me about being gay, I've just pieced it together over time, so I'm not sure if that's what I should say. Should I just spontaneously bring this up with him? There never seems to be a good time to say what I'm thinking, and the topic seems too serious to send an email or very long text message. I'm not sure if a written mode of communication would be too informal or make it seem that I don't care. At that, I'm not sure where we should go from there. Update 1. I'm thankful for all of the kind advice I received in regard to my first message here. After reading all of your words I decided I would handwrite my son a letter and send it in the mail as we live across the country. In summary I wrote about many things and the letter ended up being much longer than anticipated. I began by discussing some of my experiences with my father growing up in ways I realized I had treated my son similarly. I had wanted to do better than my father, who had moments where he could be cruel, but I failed to realize that being too reserved was also a problem and I leaned too far in that direction. After his mother left I was depressed and I didn't deal with that as well as I should have. I apologized for being absent at work and for being emotionally unavailable at times when he would have needed me the most. I mentioned I'd like to change that in the future, but it's still something that's hard for me to do and I understand he may need his own space. Then I wrote about how even though I probably don't show it well I do love him with my entire being, there's nothing he could do or be that can change that, and I'm proud of him for many things. I wrote that by extension I love whoever he loves, and his chosen family is family to me as well. All said and done the letter was several pages long. Then I mailed it, and it was incredibly hard to wait. I decided to text him to let him know I had sent him a letter as we don't typically write, and it seemed like something that warranted some warning in advance of its arrival so he wouldn't be entirely caught off guard by it. Eventually he sent me a text that he would like to call me at the end of the day. We spoke about everything in the letter. I learned that he had believed I viewed him as a burden, which was disheartening to me as I had always wanted to be a father since I was young, and I never saw him as being a burden, which I told him. 
We discussed his mother and the plethora of feelings surrounding her. This was a hard topic for me as I still have many unresolved feelings here, but I realized because of this I never explained to him everything that happened. I also learned that he was afraid to disappoint me, and that he had put a lot of effort into his career to make me proud of him as he felt this was the way to impress me and that it would make up for his defects. I brought up that focusing on work over family and interpersonal relationships was one of my bigger regrets, and he admitted that being so career-driven was straining his personal life. With everything going on at the moment he also expressed that the medical profession was weighing on him but he hadn't wanted to disappoint me by not being as emotionally strong as he thought I am. By this point in the conversation we had both said a lot of very emotional things. He brought up that he felt it was hard to talk to me because I don't make it clear what I'm thinking and so he felt it was always easier to only discuss work or accomplishments with me and nothing personal. He felt it was easier to let his relationship be an unspoken understanding between us as he felt I would be uncomfortable to know anything more. At this point I confirmed that his friend is in fact his partner. He said he felt a lot of shame about it. I told him I regretted not reaching out to him sooner, that I'm sorry that my lack of availability had created this distance between us, and that I'm always proud of him and not just for his career. We ended the conversation by discussing seeing each other in person, as it has been almost 10 years since we've actually seen each other. I expressed that I would like to fly out to visit him and his partner if he would feel comfortable, we are all fully COVID vaccinated. I now have a plane ticket for early next month, a date which is quickly approaching. I am glad for all of the encouragement I received from this website, I have nothing but gratitude for all of your kind words. Once again I am asking for a little advice. I have never met his partner in person nor have I ever spoken to him. He has been with my son for two decades at this point and likely knows him better than I do. I would like to make a good impression with him. However I don't know any gay couples, aside from them. And as was thankfully pointed out in my previous post here I am not aware of all the proper ways to describe things as I incorrectly use the term lifestyle. I would like to be invited into their lives so I wish to avoid offending either of them. Are there any suggestions of common things I should avoid saying to them? Perhaps I'm just nervous because this is coming up soon and I haven't seen my son in so long. Typing some of this out was helpful in and of itself. Update 2. Hello wonderful individuals of the internet. Almost half a year ago I posted here about reconnecting with my estranged gay son and I received the encouragement I needed to push me to do what I knew was the correct thing in my heart. With the advice I received here, I wrote my son a long letter, the contents of which I believe I explained on here if there is a way to search for old posts I am not sure. Due to the contents of that letter and an ensuing phone call my son invited me to fly out to see him and meet his partner of over 20 years. This was a terribly worrying time for me as I felt the ice was thin and I feared saying or doing the wrong thing would ruin what little connection we had forged. I went to visit them in early June and I am incredibly overjoyed to say that everything went very well. While there I had several emotionally tough conversations with my son, but I tried to listen from a place of wanting to understand and accepting that I have not always been the best father. While at times I felt incredibly hurt by what he had to say it was mostly because I felt defensive and upset with myself that I had caused him to feel this way. I wasn't always sure how to respond, but it seemed that verbalizing that I felt this way and that I would need time to give him a proper and reasoned response to some of his comments, rather than a defensive one, was the right thing to do. I would then reflect on my own and give him the response he deserved from me. While there I also had a discussion with his partner and I am glad that this man has been in my son's life. He is a truly good man, and he did say that he was cautious of me because of the past but that he hoped we could all move forward from it. I also learned on this trip that they are foster parents and have also adopted two beautiful children. I did not meet them on this first trip. My son was worried that having kept this information from me would cause me to become upset, and I was sad to have put myself in a situation where I wasn't involved. But ultimately I can only feel tremendously happy. Soon after that trip I flew out to visit them again after we had all recovered from the first trip. And soon after that I flew out a third time. I am relieved to say that after those first trips it is almost as though there was never any time we were apart and we have been talking every day. I have felt so much joy over being accepted back by my son, and for being accepted by his partner, and I am now working on selling my home and moving across the country to be nearer to them and my young grandchildren. This is a move they have welcomed and even suggested to me first. I had planned to write about my first trip, but it was quite an exhausting time for me. While it was absolutely necessary it was also draining. After a time I forgot. But I have realized that had I never posted anything here, had I just kept up the way things were, I would never have had my son or his partner in my life as I do now and I would never have known the children they have welcomed into their home. I only hope that moving forward I can live out my retirement watching my new, wonderful grandchildren grow into the bright people they will become. Nothing gives me more joy, and in part I have this place to thank for it. So thank you.
I broke my son and his girlfriend up and he doesn't know it was me. I broke up my son and his girlfriend. They had been dating for almost a year, and seemed very happy. For backstory, my son moved out pretty soon after his biological father passed. He told me he wanted to expand on life, because he was nervous he would waste it away being depressed over the death of someone so important to him. I understood completely and allowed him space and freedom, but we talked daily and he visited all the time. After a while of living alone, he moved back. It was around this time that he introduced me to Kaylee. Me and Kaylee got along immediately. She liked a mother in her life, and I think she was quick to establish that relationship with me. Off the bat I noticed she was extremely paranoid and had extreme trust issues, but she wasn't toxic or manipulative, just anxious about where my son was going after work. She'd ask me and I'd answer with he went to his friend Mike's house, they hang out to play PlayStation with each other. We both genuinely believed that my son was at Mike's house, and we had no reason to suspect he wasn't. One night, after my son came home to pick up his PS4 to hang out with Mike, Kaylee asked me to pick up some tampons and Tylenol for her. She lived close and her periods were always super intense so I was used to going out late into the night to help her. My son gets out of work at 4 p.m. and is usually home or at Kaylee's place by 5.30 p.m., 6 p.m. at the latest. It was 6 and he hadn't swung by to drop off his PS4 so I shot him a text before I left the house to let him know why I was gone. It was something like, hey, Kaylee is on her period so I'm heading out to grab supplies. You okay? He answered me while I was driving, and I checked it when I got to the store. It was something like, yeah, I'm fine. Mike needed help building a shelf he bought so I'm staying a little later. I sent back some message saying okay, be safe, all of that mother stuff. But I was not ready to see Mike, working the cash register, smiling at me as soon as I walked in. I hadn't forgotten he worked here, but obviously, figured it was his day off. I smiled back, but immediately I felt sick to my stomach. I tried to rationalize it. Maybe he means he is building it for Mike, while he works? I couldn't even think straight. I just got the tampons, some snacks and Tylenol for Kaylee and went to the register. Mike obviously started small talk with me. Paraphrasing because my memory is bad, but it went something like this, Hi Mrs. Last name. Hello, Mike. How are you doing? I'm alright. Getting some supplies for my son's girlfriend. I remembered he laughed. Speaking of your son, I haven't seen him in a few weeks. I need him to give me my PS4 controller he borrowed, can you tell him that? I felt sick again. I didn't want to put my son in the spotlight so I didn't mention the stories my son had been feeding me, I just smiled and said, I'll let him know. I paid for my stuff and left quickly. I drove to Kaylee's house and gave her the supplies, but I didn't know what to say, or how to say it. She was smiling and laughing, and looked carefree. She asked me where my son was. I couldn't lie to her, I couldn't. So I answered honestly. I don't know. I didn't know where he was, or who he was with. I just told her to call him and ask. She thanked me and I left her house. Later that night, at around 8 p.m., my son finally came home. I didn't say much to him, just asked him if he had fun. He said yeah, and went to his room. I knew I had to tell Kaylee. Soon after, I went into my room and called her. I informed her of what Mike had said, and how late he had gotten home. She told me that he said he was home hours ago, just tired so he wasn't going to visit. I could tell she was crying, and I asked her if she wanted me to come over. I went to her house and we talked about everything, and she told me she didn't want anything to do with him, and wanted to break up with him immediately. I told her she could, and if she wanted, she could be honest and say I told her. After I comforted her for a few hours, she asked if she could still contact me, even if she wasn't with my son. I said yes, but honestly, I'm hesitant about it. I love her, but it feels off to me. I would still help her, though. Fast forward a few days and my son comes crying to me that Kaylee broke up with him and isn't giving him any reason. I, of course, comforted him too. He said that she needed time to think about it and would tell him why when she knows what to say but for now, she is supposedly speechless. I was too, so I don't blame her. He cried for hours in his room, and in my arms, and regardless of what he did, of what I did, I comforted him. I want to tell him what I know, and I feel bad that he doesn't know. But Kaylee didn't tell him anything yet, so I might wait. Honestly? I feel stuck. This isn't just about cheating, even though I think he is. This is about trust, and how he is lying to me, and his girlfriend. We both know there is a possibility he isn't cheating, but he shouldn't have to lie if he has nothing to hide. Did I overstep my boundaries or did I do the right thing? To be honest, I'm not sure, what are all of your thoughts? I broke my son and his girlfriend up and he doesn't know it was me. Part 2. I wasn't going to make an update for a few days or weeks, but I took some advice from messages I got. I just wanted to clear a few things up first. I gave my son space and freedom, but I wanted him to be able to take time from me entirely if he wished. Throughout his teen years, whenever he was upset, he would ask me to leave him alone. I would oblige but honestly if he didn't speak to me for more than three days I would just ask if he was okay. After his biological father died, I told him he could have a break from talking if he wanted, and I would wait for the okay to contact him. The break only lasted for maybe a week and he wanted to call me and visit. For the actual update, Kaylee decided to give him a call. She talked things out with her sister and decided to ask him. Apparently, he was cheating, but told her that it was because she was on her period and very sensitive to everything. He said he had done it three other times, all while she is on her period. She called me and told me before my son told me, but in his defense, he was busy explaining things to his girlfriend and now Mike who he accidentally wrapped into this. It's only 12 in the afternoon, and he wants to tell me in detail after work, which I told him was okay. He told me he was sorry for lying, and I told him it was okay but it hurt my feelings. I didn't mention this in the post or to him but his biological dad cheated on me and that is why we are apart. He cheated on me before I was pregnant with my son, 
and for the first year of our marriage. I did not want my son to think that was okay. I talked to Kaylee and she is just head over heels for my son, and said if he promises not to do it again she would stay with him. I haven't told him that because that is not my business, they can talk about that. My son has sent me a few messages since about work, but he seems extremely sorry. I am a bit disappointed in him but I think it's because of what I went through and how hard being a single mother after the man you thought loved you just left. Kaylee said that she would try to be a more attentive girlfriend which honestly sucks to hear because this is not her fault. I am not going to dictate their relationship and tell her to find someone else but it does shock me that she can forgive. As much as I want to be mad at my son, I really can't. I've never gotten mad at him before and I think this situation just brought me back to everything that happened when he was little. I hope my son can learn from this. Tonight when we talk I'm going to be a little strict on him, obviously, but again he is an adult. If he says he is going to cheat on her, I cannot stop him. I really really hope he learns.